major, major issue for all community boards and many other people living in Manhattan and in surrounding areas which they buzz over. So the FAA has jurisdiction over tourists, um, anything that flies. Um, basically, they have not been very responsive, but they are accepting public comments about helicopter noise until next Wednesday. So please send some comments to the FAA, even if you just say yeah. you hate the noise. Hi, Mark. Oh, can you yeah. unmute? Mark is unmuted. Okay. I'm all set. Thanks. Hi. Good to see y'all. Good to see you again. Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't see you today, did I? Yes, you I did. Were on, no, I yes, I did at the training. Yeah, the borough president. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Kip is a hoot, isn't he? He is. He really is. Takes one of the driest subjects and makes it come alive. You should yes. see him when he does the three hour CLE with the hat and the guitar and singing songs about conflicts of interest. Um, who knew that that could be a thing, right? Exactly. Okay, don't mute me. I'm gonna make some noise while I switch chairs. So hang on. Because otherwise I can't get unmuted. And now I have to get books. Hi, Jessica, thanks for coming too. Can you unmute Jess? Well, Jessica's coming Jessica. up later, but she could be unmuted, great. Thank you, happy to be here, thanks. Appreciate how responsive you are to our invitations. It's 6.30, but I think, what do you think? We should give it a couple of minutes, Max, Saida? Yeah, I think so. Sure. So for anyone who's gotten the Johnson & Johnson vaccine within the last three weeks, if you got it more than three weeks ago, you're safe. But if you've gotten it within the last three weeks, look out for leg pain, abdominal pain, severe headaches, lightheadedness that doesn't go away, chest pain and or changes in vision. And if any of those happen, go see a doctor. It's not my advice, it's a doctor's. The, um, I was at a meeting with um, medical people talking about the Johnson & Johnson pause. Hello, Matt Bauer. I know you're muted, but we you don't we don't let people unmute themselves here, so I'm just gonna wave.
And hi, Brenda. I forgot to wave to you. I'm just going to go through the pre-meeting talk then, if that works before you guys get started. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. If this is your first time joining us, everyone will remain muted throughout tonight's presentation, except committee co-chairs and presenters. Following the presentation, co-chairs will call on members of the public that wish to speak. You can participate by going to the reactions icon and pressing raise hand and not the wave or thumbs up feature. Only press it once. If you press it a second time, your hand will go back down. If you're calling tonight from the phone, it'll be star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Please be on the lookout for a prompt asking you to confirm unmuting once the co-chairs call on you. Please note the chat is for technical support only to help with Zoom software problems and not to ask questions of the co-chairs. If you have an older version of Zoom, you'll need to go to the participants section at the bottom of your screen where you'll find the raise hand feature there. And finally, don't raise your actual hand or wave at the screen because the co-chairs will not see you. Thank you, Max. Well, I see Valerie is here and Elizabeth Ashby and Anthony Cohn, co-chairs of the uh, zoning committee. And Valerie is co-chair with me of the small business committee. So should we get started? Great. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the joint meeting of our um, April joint meeting of the small committee, the small business committee and the zoning and development committee. We have a few issues of mutual interest, um, as you can tell from the agenda. And the last item will be a small business item. So for those of you who are here just for the zoning related matters, you're free to go. Actually, you're free to go at any time, but we'd love to have you around. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Diller to talk about the small business zoning that they have implemented on the West Side. Thanks to Gail Brewer, our borough president, when she was a council member on the West Side. I know this has been percolating for years, um, but try as I, as I did when I was chair of the community board, I couldn't find any hard evidence of whether it worked or didn't work. So um, Mark and I got to talking when we were in a meeting on another program program together and uh, in about the success or and failures or issues relating to the small business zoning on the Upper West Side, which is why I invited him to be here. And I'm very glad that he accepted. Mark um, has been on Community Board 7, which covers the West Side. Mark, you could give the ge uh, geographical boundaries since 2008. He was chair of the Community Board from 2011 to 2013, and then again from 2019 until early 2021. Mark is has a lot of anecdotes about, about the zoning on the Upper West Side and is quite knowledgeable about plenty of stuff. So Mark, welcome, and uh, I'm glad to have you. So Mark, or, I, or we're glad to have you. Mark will talk about the zoning um, resolution, the zoning implementation on the West Side, and then we'll um, have questions from the public and the board members. So Mark, with uh, no ado, I will turn it over to you. And Mark, and this is Max, you have the ability to share your screen. Very good, and I'll get to that in a sec. I just wanted to say a quick thank you. Um, I, uh, and a couple of disclaimers, because I wouldn't uh, be honest with my uh, law degree if I didn't uh, start off with a few disclaimers. So um, I was chair when the uh, small business or small storefront rezoning was implemented and went through ULERP in our, in our district. Um, I am not currently an officer of CB7. I'm not speaking tonight as a member of CB7. Yeah, so you're just stuck with whatever it is that I recall and remember from, uh, from those days. Um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Department of City Planning either, who was, of course, a huge participant in this. Um, I'm not certain I'm qualified to tell you whether this was a success or a failure, but I can certainly tell you how it worked, how it came to be, and what led to it, and, and then some of the reactions um, in a somewhat less scientific way of what came about. Um, so... Um, 
Let me start by talking about, I am gonna to try to share my screen. Um, and what I'm sharing with you now is the proposal that was, um, that came before our board once upon a time. Um, and I'm gonna minimize that. Um, and this screen right here shows you a little bit about what it is that this was about. Um, because you see that there are multiple storefronts on a one block uh, frame. This happens to be between um, 84th and 85th Street on the west side of uh, Amsterdam Avenue. Um, and there were a, a handful of problems that folks were observing for a number of years on the Upper West Side uh, with respect to, to the use of uh, retail spaces on our ground floors. And I guess the first thing to note is that everything I'm gonna to talk to you about in terms of the zoning resolution uh, text amendment uh, relates to the ground floor. So um, uh, these limitations do not apply to the second floor nor do they apply to places like the, the um, Trader Joe's on 72nd Street and Broadway where it's a very modest uh, opening onto the street and then there are escalators downstairs with multiple below grade floors. Um, so the, the um, let me see, how do I do this? That's how I do this. Um, so let's go to kind of the, um, the, um, the gist of it. Um, and you see here on the right-hand side, there's a map of the special districts that came to be as a result of this effort. Um, the problem that was, that was sought to be solved was the assembling of huge storefronts um, to be used by banks, by Duane Reed's, by other big box stores, um, and by specialty stores. There's an anecdote that I'll try to resist about Dylan Candies. Um, and why was this a problem? Um, it was a problem in part because the smaller storefronts that came available or were pushed out and became and made available uh, were left vacant for non-trivial uh, amounts of time um, so that they could potentially be combined into big stores. Uh, that was a problem both because we lost and had eliminated mom and pop stores, for example, um, things like locksmiths, shoe repair guys, dry cleaners, sort of everyday quality of life kinds of things that add to the, the residential character of a neighborhood in favor of big box kinds of stores that didn't emulate that residential character. Um, and um, same with sort of non-chain clothing, paper goods, and toy stores. All of them kind of got uh, um, had a target on their head, on their on their forehead, because they were needed to make room for these much larger, wider storefronts. Um, there was an additional concern that that went hand in glove with this, which is that it was our experience on the west side that these big box stores often. Um, did not have transparency. Um, and by transparency, I'm not speaking metaphorically now, I'm talking about glazing so that, that you could see in and they could see out. One of the things that of course gives uh, safety, um, uh, adds to the safety of, of a streetscape or a neighborhood is being able to see and be seen, uh, whether you're walking alone after dark um, or whether the store itself is experiencing an issue. Um, and those were things that we sought to, to, to solve. Um, it was Gail Brewer. Um, so, so one of the things that, that you may want to think about as you, uh, as I understand you're considering whether or not this makes sense for the Upper East Side is whether any of those concerns um, are prevalent now um, uh, and, whether, um, and whether in the post pandemic world, um, this sort of an action would make sense. Um, so uh, the genesis of the idea, um, as I learned about it, uh, was obviously I learned about it through the community board. And when I became chair, it, it sort of fell to me to get this through. And I believe very strongly that it would be a good benefit for the Upper West Side. Um, but it was Council Member Brewer, or then Council Member Brewer, now, of course, Borough President, um, working very closely with the Department of City Planning. Um, and of course, with my predecessor, Mel Wymore, um, uh, my predecessor as chair of CB7 uh, to get this going. And just sharing one anecdote, um, since I mentioned Mel's name, Mel had a, a practice of having one of his nieces from Arizona, his home, his home turf, uh, come every year to go shopping in the unique um, 
stores, boutiques, um, so forth, um, uh, up and down our commercial avenues. And about a year or two before the rezoning happened, they stopped doing it because the stores that were populating Columbus and Amsterdam Avenue were the same chain stores that were in Phoenix. And why come all that way to New York just to shop at the same stores um, without protection from the rain? Um, the groundwork that was laid for this, and let me see if I can continue the right slides. The groundwork for this was that they actually mapped every storefront up and down the area. Um, and uh, they, they took note of the differing retail opportunities up and down the street um, and where there was neighborhood character to be preserved. So I don't know if you can see my cursor as I do this. Mm -hmm. You'll see that there are pockets here where the zoning does not take place. And most notably, um, sort of north of 87th Street on Columbus Avenue, going all the way up to 110th, is not a part of this commercial rezoning. And one of the reasons is that this was an urban renewal area. So this is the Robert Moses era urban renewal district. And then this is Park West Village. This is um, Douglas Houses, which is a night shift facility. Um, and so um, the small storefront neighborhood character uh, experience of the retail didn't exist on those uh, areas. Um, and, um, and there were different characteristics between Amsterdam and Columbus uh, versus Broadway. Um, Broadway also had largely by that time lost a lot of its small storefront configurations in favor of newer buildings, bigger buildings with, um, with larger footprints and larger um, expanses. Um, so um, I have some notes here because I'm trying to make sure that I use efficient, uh, use my time efficiently. Um, so, um, and the other thing I'll note is that originally this was intended to run uh, from 72nd to 96th Street, but advocacy from the community board as well as local residents and the business improvement district in the area uh, succeeded in convincing the city planning department to push it all the way to 110th, which is the northern boundary of our district. Uh, Alita asked me to share our, basically we're 59th to 110th west of the park, that's CB7, which is a little bit different, I understand, than the dimensions of CB8. Um, so the proposal basics, um, let me see if there's a, a slide that goes right to this. Um, this is sort of uh, representative of the kinds of buildings that we were uh, trying to, or storefronts that we were trying to preserve. Um, here's Broadway, which obviously has a very different character. Um, and so these are the goals, which, which were to uh, preserve the small storefronts and the neighborhood feel and character, um, and also uh, the diversification of retail opportunities when you have more stores. Um, so here is what we worked on. Um, and essentially there were two different scenarios. One is Amsterdam and Columbus, the other is Broadway. Um, the storefront frontage limitations only apply to Amsterdam and Columbus. And essentially there are two, two overarching requirements. One is that no storefront be wider than 40 feet. Um, and the other is that there be at least two storefronts every 50 feet. Um, so in effect, at least four stores. Um, um, do I have that right? Four, eight storefronts on a, on a, on a, on a typical uh, block. Um, banks were different. Banks were limited to 25 feet on the ground floor. Um, and then you see that the residential lobbies were uh, limited. So on Amsterdam and Columbus, they're limited to 15 feet on Broadway to 25. Uh, and then you see that there's also a, 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 a glazing transparency requirement. Um, there were, um, there were ex exceptions. As I mentioned, the urban renewal area, I think if I go back to that slide, this is the easiest way to see it. This is largely the urban renewal area that was, um, uh, that was excluded. Um, other exclusions included that certain uses, um, let me see if I can go to, um, okay. So this is kind of the, the paradigm of what we were going for. Um, the um, certain uses were excluded. So supermarkets were excluded uh, from the rezoning and the limitations. Uh, as were schools and houses of worship. Um, it also didn't apply to grandfather's stores. And so anything that was ex in existence at the time uh, would continue to be able to operate that way. And then the way that um, I understand that grandfathering works under the zoning resolution, um, any, any 
uh, oversized store, if you will, uh, could continue um, as long as it was within, it is reused after being ceased to be used within a two year period. Um, let's see. There was also a streamlined waiver process, and I think there's a slide on that. Um, so here's just a depiction of what we were going for with respect to keeping the storefronts um, in a way uh, that would fight the loss of neighborhood character and hopefully preserve the opportunities for mom and pop stores to remain in place. Um, this is, a, this is a, a depiction of the glazing. Um, the city planning authorization process is the, is the escape valve for this. Um, and here is a slide that talks about that. Uh, and essentially um, it's a streamlined process that allows a waiver of these, these width limitations um, when there is uh, evidence either of um, the inability to configure space rationally um, within the zoning limitations or there's a high vacancy rate nearby. Um, as a side note, um, I assume that, or I, 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 I wager that the Upper West Side isn't the only area in Manhattan that is experiencing widespread vacancy um, these days. Um, so, oh, and this is a unique one corner. Um, you see there's one little spot there that was added onto this. So um, in a store that would be otherwise non-conforming, um, you could turn it, if you continue to use it, you could continue to use it um, from one store to another, um, but not for a bank. So you couldn't increase the level of non-compliance under this zoning. Um, and there's actually a bunch of scenarios here, but essentially you get the idea that, um, uh, that if you, um, no, I guess the most important uh, thing to mention here is that once a wide store or a, a store wider than zoning would permit was broken into smaller stores, it couldn't be reassembled except for one of the exceptions like a supermarket or a house of worship or a school. Um, and so um, that's what these slides are essentially saying. Um, so I'm gonna end this, the, the, the share and then just share a couple of things. Um, it is hard to quantify um, exactly what the effects of the zoning are. Um, I've spoken, of course, over the years with commercial landlords and with brokers who've raised uh, significant concerns. Um, there are examples, for example, of um, tenants who are reluctant to look at spaces in the Upper West Side because the combination of an awful lot of my district uh, being subject to um, uh, in, in an historic district, so they're subject to LPC approval, um, combined with the small business zoning complications, um, that can be a negative for attracting folks to look at spaces in our neighborhoods. Um, and there's a concern about subdividing um, existing wider stores for fear that they could never be re reassembled. Um, so ironically, there may be a few that are perpetuated as wide stores, um, which is contrary to the intent of the zoning, but, but there it is. Um, uh, the, as far as I know, I'm not aware of anybody who has petitioned to, uh, for one of those um, uh, commission waivers to enable um, the assemblage of a larger store. The paradigm of course, is that a successful store seeks to expand to the unit next to it, which might uh, expand past the zoning. Um, and, and folks, as far as I know, have not taken advantage of that opportunity. Um, and, and there may be any number of reasons for that. Um, so there's a trade-off here that we tried to strike between uh, the stability of rent paying tenants in large spaces and preserving the character of eclectic small stores that would be uh, able to be preserving mom and pop retail opportunities. Um, this is, of course, the, the issue that, that one confronts when, try, when trying to use zoning as the tool to accomplish this goal, because zoning, of course, speaks to uses and not users. And so we can't prefer or, or write into zoning the opportunity to have one kind of retail versus another kind of retail when under the character of, uh, of, the, of the zoning resolution, they are viewed as more or less the same. Um, I'm going to stop there and, and welcome questions. I hope that that is a useful explanation of what we did 
and a little bit of, of, of our experience with it. Um, but as I say, my limitations are that I don't want to go beyond my, uh, my experience here. Um, uh, so Alita and team, uh, I'm, I'm all yours for questions. Are there any questions from the public? I don't see anyone's hands raised or from the board members. We have a particularly silent lot tonight, Mark. Um, Elizabeth, Anthony, Valerie. I, um, all right. I, I, I guess one of the one of the kind of questions that sort of comes to mind, and you sort of answered it, was about the um, the sort of carve outs. I noticed that there was a, a long stretch of Amsterdam that was missing its. Um, its designation. Um, and um, I just sort of wondered about that. And I, th I, I think you answered it in that it had already lost its character or? So thank you for that question. Um, there are, the, the, the lost its character is more relevant on Broadway because there have been a lot of combinations of spaces and so forth. So in that sense, it lost its character. Um, Columbus Avenue after the urban renewal project. And I think that's the one you're talking about. The very no, no, long... there's also a big, there's also a big sort of half of Amsterdam. It was yeah. the one that kind of struck me. So, so boy, did you pay attention to that map? You did great. Um, so, um, so exactly correct. And the, the areas where that applied are the urban renewal areas. And then the areas where there were, um, um, so, so I'm sorry, so let me just organize that thought for a second. There are two basic things going on there. One is the urban renewal area, which under Robert Moses, they didn't have any retail on those avenues. We're, we're actually taking steps to change, to go back to add the retail, but this was the tower in the park zoning where they, mm -hmm. they made those extra <laughs> wide sidewalks and then eliminated the retail on, this, on the avenues I'm not sure why, but they did it. And, um, and now we're trying to add the retail back because it adds to safety, it adds to street liveliness and so forth. So because there was no retail on those stretches, there's nothing to preserve. Therefore, the retail zoning didn't, didn't apply there. The, all, the, but the Amsterdam part that you um, uh, zeroed in on was the, um, it, part of that was Douglas Houses, which is a NYCHA facility, a NYCHA campus. Another is Park West Village, which is a um, another kind of super block tower in a park zoning on uh, on our side of the park. Um, so those are areas again where there was no street frontage um, at all. Really, they're all recessed back off of the avenue. There wasn't retail in them. Again, for reasons that I can't explain, um, NYCHA facilities tend not to have retail in their buildings or on their campus. So. Um, so that's why those areas were excluded because in effect, as you said, there was nothing there to preserve whether the character was the new character of big storefronts or the old character, there's nothing there at all. So there's nothing to preserve. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Anthony is one of the co-chairs, by the way, of the Zoning and Development Committee. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, next we have Elizabeth or Anthony, do you wanna handle the questions while you decide um, and who, who for the next part as well. Um, Michelle, go ahead. Could you unmute? Oh, Michelle, you're already unmuted. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Mark, for the presentation and for all your hard work on that project. Um, let me just ask you some questions procedurally. How long did this take from start, you know, to the eventual granting? And um, <clears throat> what rationale did you have to show or prove or what premise did you have to support in order to get city planning and the powers that be to agree with the concept? Uh, thank you. Some of that is before my, um, my, my uh, <clears throat> involvement in the project. I became chair in November of 2011 and the, uh, the project was certified in early 2012. And so um, the, my involvement was a Euler process um, and we all know what that, that entails. Um, but like an awful lot of, uh, of, of projects that go through Euler, there is a long pre-certification period where things are 
um, discussed and mapped out and perhaps reinvented and so forth. So I was generally aware that for, I would say the better part of a year before certification, that there was analysis going on. Some of that, of course, was the combination of the council member and the, and the city planning staff, I believe literally going door to door up and down the avenues, mapping out what the, um, the retail uses were, um, as well as uh, conferring with community members about what would and would not work in certain areas. Uh, so I think there was a good year there where there was study and analysis by both DCP staff and the staff of the uh, council member. Okay. Uh, and, then the, and you asked about the rationale. The rationale, quite frankly, was that um, we were experiencing <clears throat> this rash of banks taking up half of a block of, uh, of an avenue uh, with essentially no business to support in that space. <clears throat> and, and it was, um, so, so acres and acres of empty desks just so that they could have what amounted to a ground floor billboard for a retail bank establishment. Um, and uh, that's uh, ironically, that seemed to be going out of vogue right around the time that the zoning was passed, um, but it continued to be a concern enough to make sure that if the trend should reverse, that we should make sure that we're protected from that. So that was among the rationales. And the other rationales were that people were observing one after another of small storefronts either being forced out or becoming available after leases terminated. And um, then they were being in effect warehoused mm -hmm. against the possibility and sometimes the likelihood that they would be assembled as a much wider store. And that was, that was a concern. Well, I'll tell you, just uh, a year of prep, that's really not bad as things, as things go. Um, <clears throat> to get other districts, it takes many, many more years. So that's not bad. How much involvement did the actual store owners and residents have, aside from the community board? Were they canvassed? Did you make presentations to them? Was their support solicited in some way? What manner? What did you have to do to bring people on board? And was bringing them on board an important part of all of this? Um, so again, you're, you're, you're going a little bit beyond my experience. So I'll, I'll, I'll speak generally about the, the community board aspect of it. It is my understanding that there, were, uh, there was outreach um, to the business improvement districts and to um, individual store owners, but I'm not familiar with exactly how that happened. Um, there were pre-certification uh, discussions at our land use committee um, about the project uh, as a work in progress before it was certified. And that's kind of where I first learned about it. And then I became chair and was tasked with um, seeing it through. So that's kind of where I came onto the scene. So I apologize that I can't give you a better, better pre-certification detail. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Marco, you're next. Would you unmute Marco, please? Thank, uh, you. thank you, Lida. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what kind of impact do you have? Uh, I think you have a lot of la uh, landmark buildings in, in uh, Broadway. Is that correct? We have, uh, at this point, about half of my district is in one historic district or another. Most of the Upper West Side is found in historic districts. There are a handful of individual landmarks um, and, and several of them are up and down Broadway. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I, the point is how difficult it was to work with uh, landmarks and, uh, and city planning because one regulated to the other one. And uh, what kind of analysis you have about of the energy compliance? Because I like the idea of be seen and being seen. That's good concept, but at the same time, it's a bad concept for the energy preservation. It's, 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 it's very complex, that part. And so what kind of the dilemmas you face in that direction? The landmark, as my, my understanding is that LPC was not involved in the rezoning effort per se. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, the glazing aspects of it um, could be accommodated within the um, existing LPC rules. Um, and since then, in about 2015 or 2016, the Landmark Preservation Commission uh, revised its rules to expand the ability to um, uh, receive approval 
for storefront infill at the staff level without having to go to a public hearing. So, uh, and, and our board, and I'm sure yours and others, uh, commented on that um, to, uh, as a good thing in general, so that, that stores could have a safe harbor um, in redesigning or, or uh, moving forward with things like energy uh, uh, compliance. But truthfully, the discussion at our board that I recall was all about safety and be seeing and being seen. That was the, the, larger, the larger concern. So the other question that I have is how important was uh, in then in that time uh, the city the city council uh, uh, Mrs. Ruer and in the process it means I think that is I think if I'm not wrong I think it was crucial correct me if I'm wrong um, I would maybe even go a little further um, it, I I would credit her with the idea that we then. Um, we as a board adopted thought was a good idea and carried, helped carry through. Um, we've all heard about council member preferences um, on ULERP applications. Um, so of course her colleagues, uh, I, I, I don't presume to speak for her about her colleagues, but, but it is one of those areas where I suspect her having been a, a strong advocate for this um, and having supported mom and pop operations in whatever way she can, uh, was the inspiration for this. She then got the, uh, she got the ball rolling with the Department of City Planning. Um, and as an amendment to my earlier answer uh, to Michelle, um, uh, my, my guess is that, um, that there was probably some period of general conversation between DCP and the council member before this even became a thing. So um, I hope that that, that, I hope that answers your question. I think- Yes, that, thank you a lot. It's very, yeah. very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a I, I certainly support mom and pops in the neighborhood character. That's why we all, uh, I think, serve on community boards. But uh, I wondered if it had been your plan had been in effect long enough to know uh, whether uh, it affected the demand for small stores. If, if, if small. Uh, and uh, whether it affected the success of small uh, of stores, uh, if they were less successful because they were smaller or more successful, uh, and if people wanted to have a small store or wanted a much uh, bigger store. I know to not talking about banks, uh, but uh, you just plain ordinary uh, retailers. Right, I think that the, uh, the, a way to look at it is that uh, preserving the smaller storefronts would eliminate um, a pressure to either raise rents that would either force out the, the, um, the small mom and pop store or would be an incentive to combine them so that, um, uh, so that combinations would, um, would eliminate those small storefronts um, that by, by virtue of the rezoning we would have eliminated some of that pressure that worked against uh, mom and pop stores and worked against them in a way different than say a Dwayne Reed or a big box store could handle. Those big box stores obviously have credit worthiness that any landlord would be crazy to pass up under certain circumstances. So we were trying to level the playing field a little bit by giving an edge to mom and pop stores with respect to the width of the store. Um, so I think that's the way to look at what, we, what it is we are trying to do. Um, I'm not hiding from the fact that it was controversial then and it's still controversial now. And do, do you know if, you, if, if, this is, if your methods are successful yet, is it? I'm, I'm not, uh, as I said at the top, it's hard for me to know that because there are as many opinions. There, there, it's hard to know what data about that would look like. And it's especially hard to know what the data would look like now that we're in a pandemic. A year and some, uh, last January, last December, one of the biggest issues at Community Board 7 was uh, from the community itself was the scourge of vacant storefronts at that time. Of course, during uh, COVID, so many more store stores have been um, closed or closed up for the period. Um, uh, uh, that it made the concern um, 
uh, prior to COVID um, look um, uh, look almost tame by comparison. Um, so uh, it is difficult to 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 put numbers around that, um, and I think that uh, at this point, those the folks who were who are skeptical of this continue to be skeptical. The folks who were hopeful about this continue to be hopeful, but I'm not aware of any data-driven way of, <clears throat> of, of concluding success or failure at this point. I just want to add on to something that Mark had said about the success or, um, or common perception of it, which is that Peter Arnston, who is the president of the Manhattanville bid, had mentioned in another program we were doing or in the preparation to that program that he's very, he seemed to be happy with the idea of the with the way the small business zoning was working out because his neighborhood is is has been um, gentrifying economically and the businesses have changed. So he mentioned that I did invite him to this program, but he was not able to attend. Um, Anthony, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, let's see, we have uh, questions from Elaine. You could unmute. Either. Okay. Wow. Life does pass us by. Can you hear me? I sure can. Thank In you. In 2014, the zoning committee of CBA looked at this issue and was asked by the current city council member, Gail Brewer, and the CBA 7 to wait until we saw what would be the outcomes and what were the lessons learned. One of the things we did learn was that some storefronts, including banks, would have a small storefront, but as you went back, they had a huge back. That was not what was the, uh, the, the, the reason to do this. Our zoning here on the east side is slightly different than what's on the west side on the avenues. And our avenues, and, and right now, as you all know, we're fighting to maintain the 210 height limit for which we have some very good support from our representatives, but it's a slow process. But in our retail space on the avenues, it is required that there be retail. How you uh, define that or limit it is that we cannot have something more than 10,000 square feet. Now, we have a target that played games with going in the basement and whatever. We don't need to go into it because I'm tired of hearing that one. But the, the issue for us would be, we can look at this and, and I totally agree, Mark. The world has changed since 2014 when concrete or facade type shopping has changed. But it has not changed to the point that we need cleaners and shoemakers. And if we look at the contextual zoning, you're to have stores that meet the needs of the people living in the area. So it's not a Amazon can get your shoe repaired. I'm sorry, Amazon. But how do we go back to ensuring that we continue the, within the contextual zoning that we have, that we maintain whether it's a restaurant or a, uh, I can't think of the word, but uh, daily needs, shoemakers, dry cleaners, laundry mats, et cetera. How do we do that? I don't know if for the east side, we need to rezone or we need to work with building owners to understand what it means to le live in a community. Because we looked at this and you will have the major box stores, whether it's Target or Best Buy or whoever they are, try to come in and work with people to attempt to rezone. And we don't have the support in this city at this point 
to continue our rezoning as is. Now, I'm not talking about we can adapt, but when you, Mark, talked about some businesses setting up X space and then they want to expand, well, who are they? What are they doing to serve our neighborhood? And that's what I see missing in our conversation, that the zoning must continue to allow us to have neighborhoods we live in. The contextual zoning says when we're building, you're supposed to put in stores that meet the local needs. We don't need, and it's interesting, I think the banks and the uh, Walmarts and whatever might be killing each other at this all and maybe a mood issue. But how do we move forward as a community? I mean, we were looking in 2014 to look at what did we need to do here in the community? And we were saying, hold, let's look at lessons learned. And we did learn lessons. You can have a small frontage, but a huge operation. I put that out for you to all think about I'm, I'm glad we're having the conversation. Uh, uh, how many years? 14, 7, 11, uh, 8 years later. But we need to look at what we can do to preserve small business. And I don't think it's zoning. It's getting the landowners to do affordable rents. That's why we're losing. Thank you. I, the only thing I'll add to, to as, a, as a response to that, um, uh, which is obviously very, very focused on uh, your district and where you know much better than I, um, is that, that this rezoning on our part was a very specific response to a very specific condition. And you may very well be experiencing um, similar but very distinct um, uh, challenges to your small businesses. So I'll just leave it at there and say that and I hope I was clear that this was not a one size fits all um, uh, 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 process. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we have uh, Jessica Walker and then Craig later. Hi, Jessica. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, thank you so much. I'm actually here to talk about another item, but I couldn't help but weigh in because this is so interesting. Um, I just wanted to say, I. I you know, I, I've followed this for a while. I did follow what happened uh, on, on the West Side, Mark. And I, I guess I just would say that I, um, uh, sorry, everybody, I'm, I'm with the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. I should have prefaced that. Uh, so we're working on a lot of small business uh, issues at the moment. Um, and I think that um, the issue of rezoning uh, that, that Ms. Walsh raised, I think is exactly right. We're looking at that as well. The, the nature of retail is changing, even from uh, you know several years ago when, when Mark uh, instituted this zoning. And I think that what we're gonna be pushing for in the next year really is to have the city think about uh, retail uh, as a, a necessary amenity to a community. And so that means that just like we would have affordable housing uh, in development, that we need to have affordable retail uh, as well. And I'm happy to talk more about that. I don't want to steal the meeting, but um, I just wanted to echo some of the things that Ms. Walsh said. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Anthony? Uh, yes. All right. Now we have Craig later. Hi, good evening, everyone. I had, oh, there he is. Yeah. I, um, I had three separate questions sort of. Um, the first is, and you may not know the answer, I know you said that it's not, that the data isn't necessarily out there for you to be able to um, and answer quantitatively, but is there any sense as to whether it has had any impact on commercial rents along the corridors where the zoning was implemented? And also, this is more qualitative anyway, what has happened in terms of new construction in the way that buildings have been designed at street level in terms of the way that spaces are configured and, and how has that worked out? Or has there along these corridors just not been that much development that you can't tell? And then, and you may have addressed this, I may have missed it, but how are restaurants being treated in this type of scenario? And are there any 
carve outs or different rules for restaurants and um, especially given this time we're living in where restaurants have um, unique challenges. So I hear three questions. I made a quick note. I hope I catch all three points. Uh, forgive me and help me if I don't. Um, with respect to the effect on rents, um, it won't surprise you. Um, a, a, I don't have a data tabulation on that. There may be someone who does. I see Brenda Levin on, on, your, on your Zoom. So maybe uh, Brenda, uh, who follows these things very carefully, uh, maybe she can help with that at a different time. I don't want to put her on the spot. Um, but um, but there's, um, there are experts out there that probably follow that. I'm not one of them, so I don't, I don't want to overstate my, uh, uh, my place in all of this. Um, what I can share is that <clears throat> the Upper West Side Save Our Stores folks and other uh, groups within the community board were consistently concerned about rents and about vacancies um, uh, are always talking about whether the rents really are affordable um, and brokers tell us um, with citation to chapter and verse that landlords are doing their best to, um, to be accommodating some more than others for sure. So it's hard, uh, so I don't have the data on, <clears throat> on the effect on rents per se. Um, the, the, the only thing I'll say about that is that I'm not aware of anybody um, trying to avail themselves of any of the ways in which you can get out from under these zoning restrictions. So that tells me that, that um, there's only a limited number of opportunities that, have, um, that somebody uh, wanted to push back on. <clears throat> With respect to new construction, you're absolutely right. There's relatively little of that on these avenues. There is one that's going up right now and then um, they are conforming to the zoning um, uh, but the, and there aren't a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, um, there aren't a lot of full block buildings that are going up um, on Amsterdam or Columbus where this would be an issue. Um, and then with respect to restaurants, no, restaurants are not a preferred or separate category under this zoning, the way, for example, that supermarkets, banks, I'm sorry, supermarkets, um, houses of worship and schools are on the more generous end and banks are on the less generous end. So um, our restaurants <coughs> tend to be in these, uh, to, to be conforming to these uh, requirements anyway. An awful lot of these, uh, these uh, stores that we're talking about in Amsterdam and Columbus are in old fashioned tenement sized buildings where it's a little bit tricky, both not just from the landmarks perspective, but from the construction perspective um, to break through and join two, two spaces together unless it happens to be the case that the two side-by-side -side buildings are owned by the same person, which is not always the case. So restaurants are not in a different category than anybody else, I think is the answer to your question. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's see, Elaine uh, has another question or comment teed up. She yeah, I, I do think that the east side is slightly different than the west side. And our zoning on the avenues does require retail space on the ground floor. We have seen the demolition of our tenements on the avenues and are fighting and trying to move forward a proposal for a 210 height limit on the avenues and hope and they must have retail on the ground floor. So that's different than, than the west side. But what we're seeing also is if you look at what has happened in legislation, et cetera, when the federal government no longer required co-ops to reduce or limit their outside income to 20%, we then saw a change in the avenues where co-ops owned the property because they could then begin to increase their rent, okay? And that has had a negative impact for the community, maybe not for, and I'm not sure any longer for the residents, because as we all know, those buildings that had, whether they were con, um, leases with co commercial establishment or not, as these commercial establishments went out, even the condos, 
lost income and it went back to the cost to the shareholder. So, you know, there, there's a lot of financial and economic pieces here, but I, I think we need to focus on what do we want for community? We want to be able to have shops that provide service. And I think, and, and I'm glad the, small, the business uh, chamber of commerce is on, we need to work together to look at zoning or not. If you wanna stay in existence with a commercial entity and not compete with all the online, you need to work with us to identify what we need in the retail space and make it happen. And as we tear down on this side of the city, the east side, the number of avenues that are now vacant lots, whether it's, Brenda, you know, 79th, 78th, uh, 79th, 80th and 1st, 85th, 86th, you, I can keep naming them. These are not little entities. These are huge spots to redevelop. We need to work with the developers and the landlords to make it happen that we're a livable community. I will disclose, I was born and raised here in Yorkville. Boy, has it changed. And I'm losing friends now who lived here because it's no longer the neighborhood. Look, we know New York City is a neighborhood of five blocks, north, south, east, and west, okay? What do we do to preserve this? How do we bring the developers, the retail into this? You know, in the last economic downturn, the banks disappeared. Oh, now they're back. But you know, they're not back as much as they are. And the, uh, what do you call them? The uh, Walmart, not Walmart, Walgreen, Vitae, they're, and CVS, they're consolidating. They're making money now on the, the COVID vaccines. But how do we as a community move forward? I don't know if we really need rezoning on the east side for this because it fits in. But if it is, then we'll work towards it. It'll be our fourth priority on the, I don't mean that a fourth issue on, on the east side, but you got to look at what's going on in the minds of the people who own it and who owns. Let's stop this. Let's look at rezone. No, rezoning takes 10 years. I'm not going to be here anymore. Okay. Neither were a lot of people on the screen. Sorry, I don't mean to offend, but we need to get it done now. And to get it down now is to get city planning to work with each community to ensure whatever development comes in, it includes what is needed for a community. I see Matt here. Madison Avenue is different, but boy, have they suffered in this economic downturn because of COVID. What do we do there? And that's the high-end tourist trap contingent. I don't mean trap. I mean, whatever. I mean, so let's move forward and look at what we can do. But what can we do to get the city agencies to work with the community? That's my question. I'm tired of trying to get the city to do it. They got to come forward and say, we want to work with you as a community. And it doesn't matter politically who's controlling what their agenda is. The agenda is us who live here. Good night. Don't Thank leave you, yet, Elaine. Elaine. Hmm? I said, don't leave yet when you said good night. Anthony, sorry. No, no. That's I'll, all right. There are vote coming, I'll stay. <laughs> and um, all right, we have uh, Betty Cooper Wallerstein who is on the phone. Have I, uh, can you hear me? Have I unmuted? Yes, we can. Okay. Mark, that was an extremely interesting presentation. Um, there's so much difference between the West and the East side. 
you um, you didn't mention Landmark West, but they did a fabulous job, and they rushed to get all of the historic area protected, and that was a big help. Um, but it's very different over here, and um, what I, the, a big difference too is who was heading up the city planning commission in the time that you were working and before you. Um, and I wonder if you do remember who that was, because they were different people than we have now. They were people who were, and I'm sorry to say it, but they were much more um, educated in the efforts and they, that they had to do. And as you explained, they worked with you. Um, so do you remember who the head of the City Planning Commission was in, in, the, in those days? Sure do, and I'm going to decline your invitation to characterize uh, the current regime versus the uh, the previous one, and just say that uh, um, that I worked with both, and 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 I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, uh, Amanda Burden was the chair of the um, of the City Planning Commission and the mm -hmm. Department of City Planning at the time, um, and. Um, whether it well, was no, I didn't. I didn't want to say that. That you know, no, you were you as you explained it. You had uh, great support uh, from the city planning commission when you were there and before you when they were you know working to try to work together. Uh, we haven't you know it's it's a different group now. So it was Amanda Burden who was there then. That was it was, and you know, know, this was an unusual um, to, to 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 maybe to to. to Pick up just a little bit on the uh, the most previous points. Um, this is only one tool, and it's kind of a creative use of zoning as a tool to try to preserve um, the kind of built fabric and the kind of retail experience that I heard some of you folks um, share uh, about about valuing. But it's only one tool, um, and and uh, and it may or may not have application. You know your district so much better than I do. Um, uh, I, I do appreciate the shout out to Landmark West. Um, they, of course, along with the West End Preservation Society, mm -hmm. um, right. are terrific advocates for um, uh, one of the biggest reasons why we, we have so many historic districts preserved in our neighborhood. Um, I will say that one of the reactions of some of the folks um, at the time of this rezoning and since is that since so many of these avenues that are sought to be preserved by the storefront rezoning, <clears throat> excuse me, are also in historic districts that, mm -hmm. that the chant, that the need for it perhaps isn't as great as we were portraying. I think time will tell on that. Um, but I, uh, but I take your point and you're certainly correct that we were lucky. Of course, you have some great, um, uh, uh landmarks preservation advocates on the Upper East Side as well. Um, so yes, uh, we do. Uh, the the friends of and um, and was it the mm -hmm. the and the Carnegie Hill group mm -hmm. and and so forth. Yeah. So um, well, all props there too. Um, anyway, um, there there was a great partnership there between the council member and the department, and then between the two of them and the community board. Um, mm -hmm. We would have gone nowhere without all of that, and that's exactly correct. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, unless there are other questions. Mark, thank you so much. Craig, I have thank to say you, you answered, you asked the identical questions that I had made notes to ask about rents and new developments. So thank you for that. And Mark, um, you spent a lot of time with us this evening sharing your experiences and your knowledge and uh, um, how everything turned out or you went about it. So thank you for your generosity. It's my pleasure, and I'm, I, I hope that uh, it's more experience than knowledge, but I hope that it's a use to you as you move forward with all these difficult issues. You, we all, as community board members, have big tasks ahead of us, and so uh, I wish you well. It points out the great challenges, so thank you. I'll see you soon, thank I hope. You. Thank you. Anthony? Okay, the, the, the next agenda item is the, um, the effort on the part of the um, current mayoral administration uh, to continue and make permanent the open restaurants program. Um, as all of you know and have experienced, uh, the uh, open restaurants program was started last June 
And um, sometime at the beginning of March, the mayor announced an effort to um, make that permanent. In other words, that the um, uh, the out open outdoor cafes um, or open outdoor seating of restaurants um, would become a permanent feature uh, in in the city or at least in Manhattan. And um, we were hoping that we would have a copy of uh, the proposed zoning text amendment um, to talk about this evening. Uh, of course, we do not. Um, it's probably uh, too early from there, from city planning's perspective to have actually figured out uh, how they wanna make this permanent and easy to do, which is their goal. Um, I don't know if there are, what's interesting to me about this is that I don't, I look at it, and this is personally, I look at this um, uh, from a, uh, really from a zoning perspective and don't have any kind of sense of how people who are small businessmen, uh, business owners um, uh, feel about it, about making this sort of thing permanent, even when we're allowed to go back inside our restaurants. And so, it might be interesting to get some commentary from those who feel it's um, from sort of both viewpoints, uh, if there are two viewpoints. Um, and I see Elaine has her hand up. Uh, the, the question I have, and I think you all know, I had a brother who closed his restaurant after 35 years. So I'm very sensitive to the needs of restaurant owners. But I guess the question I have is that we have a number of streets in our community and in the city that are restricted, 72nd, 79th, 86th, to outdoor restaurants. So how does this new approach impact where we already have restrictions? We look at the zoning and I wonder how does it impact where some restaurants have the frontage to have some outdoor space, some do not. Then we have some who've taken over the entire sidewalk plus the street. And you, as you walk down, have a minimum amount of space to walk. So we're looking at small business, what their needs are. We also have retail. Should they then now be allowed, and let's go back 100 years and put all their items out on the sidewalk? I mean, where do we go on this? It, this is an emergency situation. It will change. There's a need to really work with the landowners who charge the rents, who may have been generous or may not have been generous. But we need to balance that. You know, how do we equate the struggles of Madison Avenue with the struggles of First, Second, and Third Avenue? And Lex, I mean, right now we have in our neighborhood Lexington Avenue, we're down to a single lane because the bus has a special lane, then we have a little parking, then we have the restaurants. There's no flow. There is a city here that has pedestrians in, in, in cars and trucks. I'm not gonna get into the bicyclists because that's a whole other area I don't wanna touch. But how do we mix this? How do we look at as a community what we want? I understand the trauma of, of, of the restaurants, but I can also see art galleries deciding, oh, let's put a restaurant as the museums have all done. Let's put a, muse a restaurant there and we'll move it out into the sidewalk. We have a residential community also. So how do you balance it? That's the challenge. 
So you can't favor one over the other, but how do we do this as a community? Bye. Thank you, Elaine. Welcome. Um, Michelle. Yeah, uh, let me make some points that I've made before, but perhaps to a different audience. Um, I was very surprised when the proposal came to make this permanent. My first question was why? We understand that the restaurants, that this was an accommodation to help the restaurants during this particular time in our history. Uh, they were devastated by the pandemic. Many businesses closed. We don't have to go into it. I understand fully and supported uh, that something special should be done for the restaurants to help them su survive. Prior to the pandemic, each of these restaurants, as a small business, business owners, did their own research, did their own demographics, did their own business plan, and made a decision to pick a certain location, sign a lease, with the projection that they would that they could or would be successful as that entity going forward and they were hit with unusual circumstances so of course they were stymied in their tracks however as business people they made a decision now as we return to normal whatever that will be certainly businesses will start to reopen the vaccine is the biggest driver of business and success that we have so Assuming that they still have, that these owners still have the business skills, assuming that when things get back to normal, that they still know the reasons from the, for them having chosen this location and assuming that they could, these could be successful, I'm going to assume that the, that has all remained the same. My question is why has the city made a decision to keep something going that will no longer be needed for the benefit of any individual business that will infringe on any current zoning. And to my mind, zoning, the zoning resolution is the only reason the city isn't in chaos and it's in breach a good percentage of the time. That why did they decide to have to rezone for those people who are on on streets where zoning where where zoning would not permit this, um, putting people out in a pedestrian crowding, increased vermin and sanitation issues, uh, a general vis visible uh, visual blight on the city as each business has its own particular architectural style, and all kinds of upheaval for everybody else who lives here. Businesses that won't be on the sidewalk, residents who live there, for every other person who lives in this city, they have made a decision to cause an upheaval in order to benefit um, the, the restaurant community, which will no longer need such a benefit when this is over. So you have to question and why they are doing this. I don't know the pressures that are on the administration. I'm not gonna ascribe motives, but I think we can all think what might have happened in order to cause this decision. But I think that the administration owes us an explanation. I think they have to come to the community and say, look, the reason we're doing this is I have not heard a reason for this. Um, also, what I have been reading is that there are plenty of people that are going to jump on the bandwagon here. Number one, a landlord is now going to say, if you're giving that landlord additional uh, footage in the front of his store, he's going to say, oh, well, my store is now no longer 2,500 square feet. I'm now adding another 500. I'm going to rent for 3,000 square feet. The other side of that is, well, number one, why should he be making money on what is a public sidewalk? Um, and the same with the consumer. Why is the consumer's sidewalk for which the consumer and residents pay taxes, why is it being given to a private entity? So, I mean, first and foremost, I can think of nothing but pitfalls here for an industry that it's very questionable as to whether or not it's needed. But first and foremost, I think we ought to invite the administration here and any of its representatives um, 
anybody in any city agency and tell us why um, the administration has come uh, to this decision. Michelle and, and everybody else, uh, we are planning small business, sanitation, and the environment, transportation, zoning is welcome, health, human, the, the health committee is welcome to talk and to bring the community, the restaurants, the small businesses, transportation people, pedestrians, lane, sorry, but bicyclists, cars, trucks, anyone who has an interest in what's going on on the streets to talk about this open restaurants program because not only is DCP planning a text amendment to get rid of zoning as it pertains to having restaurants on the street, um, which certainly applies to 86th Street at the very least that I can think of right now, but also DOT is planning um, and, and having public hearings about its own set of rules that it's, I think, planning to release in September. So we're trying to organize something that's, that's very general um, and inviting not only our council members, but various alphabet soup of city agencies that have jurisdiction over any one or all of the various moving parts that make up this so-called open restaurants program. So stay tuned for that. And then um, the other thing is that, so this was just about the, the zoning in, I guess in advance of DCPs coming out with the text amendment, because I don't know what their timeline is going to be, but certainly I guess they also wanna have this done along with many other things before the mayor leaves office. Thank you for allowing me to interrupt. So not at all, Alita. So I'm very happy to hear that because, of, the, of course, that'll be terrific. You'll have input from all of the stakeholders. However, I'm interested in hearing the rationale specifically from the administration. Um, in much the same way, they never made the case as far as I'm concerned, but in much the same way as we asked them to come and address us, and they did when they were proposing the Marine Transfer Station. They never came up with a good reason. <clears throat> the bottom line uh, with that is there was some kind of a thought about equity of communities, you know, having Marine Transfer Stations, however, that it doesn't belong in any residential community. I don't care where that community is. They never could make that case. Uh, they ended up implementing it, but they did come to us and offer to make the case. That's who I'm interested in hearing. I want to hear the mayor's office. I want to hear uh, SBA. I want to hear anybody who is a decision maker. Uh, how the community feels about it is very important. All of the stakeholders, I want to hear from all of them. But first and foremost, this thing is being proposed. I want to hear why. Thank you. Thank so you, if Michelle. If we could arrange for that, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, we have, um, we have, oops, uh, we have Marco. Or did Marco we have some something? members of the public, Anthony. I see Matt Bauer. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, Matt Bauer. Yeah. Okay. Anthony, you should start doing all the public. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Yes, thank you. Okay. And Betty Matt, Cooper Wallerstein as well, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, um, good evening. I'm Matt Bauer from the Madison Avenue Business Improvement District, and I'm actually sitting in my office, uh, two floors above uh, Lagalu and Serafina on the 61st Street uh, right now. And I could tell you, I mean, this this privilege, this discussion, you know, they've told me and other restaurants uh, in our district just told me uh, how um, the open restaurant program has really kept them going and uh, allowed them to survive uh, in these very, very difficult uh, times. And, and there really is, at least in their own mind, you know, a lot of uncertainty as to when people were going to be utilizing restaurants uh, at their full capacity. Um, you know, that's certainly, you know, the, that's at, at really at the heart of this issue is when are people gonna be physically comfortable and emotionally com uh, comfortable to be all in a restaurant at that same level as they were pre-pandemic. Um, you know, in terms of, of you know, zoning, I, I, certainly we, we're not involved in that determination. I, I could say though that uh, when I, one of the first things that we were involved with when, when uh, I started working here a while ago was to allow uh, small sidewalk cafes on Madison Avenue. And, and that really did help in creating a sense of vitality on the street. And I think what 
a lot of folks feel about open restaurants that are in the broader retail community, because, you know, Madison Avenue, as many folks have mentioned already at this meeting, uh, you know, really does contain a mix, um, is that it did give a sense of aliveness, uh, which I know is a very technical term, um, to the uh, to the street. And, you know, we, we really just need that uh, so much. Uh, and, you know, just appreciate, you know, this board and this committee's efforts um, and, you know, to maintain small businesses. You know, we're working on a lot of different initiatives right now. Um, one thing that even came from our uh, small business reopening committee is working on a loyalty program uh, for shopping at all the different types of businesses on Madison Avenue, um, from restaurants to boutiques to hair salons and looking at the street really as an ecosystem. But you know, just back, into, back to open restaurants, it really has uh, been such a, a tremendous help to maintain our restaurants and our jobs that are working, uh, folks that are working in the restaurants. And, and you know, it, it, uh, we just appreciate, uh, um, you know, folks here in this community really utilizing those restaurants because those were really were those people who were really there uh, when, when it first began. It was folks from the Upper East Side visiting their local restaurants and really keeping them going. So thanks so much for that. Anthony, be, be, thanks, Matt. Anthony, before we go to Andrew Fine, can I just read what um, I had asked Will to send over information about the open restaurants program and the sure. zoning proposed zoning text amendment. So it's the final proposed zoning change would remove zoning limitations that may prevent the opening the open restaurants program from becoming permanent. So it sounds like the um, emphasis will be on getting rid of any zoning that restricts the restaurant, the open restaurants program. Obviously they're restricted by the presence of fire hydrants and, and sometimes bike lanes or bus stops or bike racks, but uh, the city bike program. But um, this is specifically about just eliminating, it sounds like any zoning that would impede the ability of restaurants to stay in business forever. So we're talking potentially also about something that where there's there's no evaluation process, it doesn't sound like built in. So, so maybe part of the idea might be to collect concerns, even though DCP says it will be having public hearings, to collect concerns prior to, or as soon as possible, to just start uh, building up areas to explore. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. And uh, Andrew Fine, if you could unmute him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as usual, I tend to agree with Elaine and Michelle, uh, which is probably no great surprise. Um, in my opinion, the businesses that we're talking about were clearly compromised for at least a year and a year and counting. I think that in order to um, properly support them and to make them whole in the long term, that we should give them the leeway of approximately the same amount of time to recover and, and recoup through the, uh, through the sidewalks and the streets. And so I, I would say from the time that they are back to 100% capacity for indoors, that we should give them somewhere between a year and a year and a quarter to recover their losses. And then from that point on, um, it should be done. And um, we should move back to normality and move back to uh, streets for cars. Um, and that's, that's what I've got to say. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. I think, go, go ahead. Unmute him again. Thank you for listening. It was, uh, it was my final point. I'm sorry about my hairdo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Betty Cooper Wallerstein is next. Hi, thank you very much. I agree also with uh, Michelle. Um, she always expresses everything so well. Um, what we have um, 
you know, it was good. It was fortunate that we were able to assist the restaurants. But to do it forever, uh, I think, is going to be very difficult and make it very difficult uh, for people to walk. And uh, we did have uh, in many blocks on the Upper East Side, York and others, but particularly York, where we had a problem getting onto the bus, the 31, because the restaurants had were out in the street and the buses were having to pull up in the middle of the street and taking up what are already uh, not enough uh, lanes. So uh, that's a problem. And also there there is a problem with people, with the restaurants that had to use the streets, uh, the, you know, out in the street instead of the sidewalk. That's what I was talking about, but also the delivery trucks that had to deliver were also double parking, and it made it very difficult. Very, very took a very long time to get down York Avenue. Um, the as long as they are people are able to go back in when we can fully go back in. Many restaurants already had two or three tables outside. I can think of several. It had them on the sidewalk. It still allowed enough room for people to walk. So that's a good thing to do, and maybe we could continue that. And, and in those streets that are wide enough, uh, have a little bit more you know, space for a couple more or whatever. But I think in the long run, to do this on a year, yearly basis is, uh, does it not seem to be um, what's going to work for everyone. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, and we have uh, Faith Frazier. I think is the only other. Yeah. If you could unmute her, Max. I did. Um, go ahead, Faith. Okay. Let's try again. Remember, it's star six to unmute, Faith. Mm. Thank you, Sadie. Hello. Here you go. Hi, Hi. It's Faith Fraser. I, I live in the East 70s. And I want to echo and agree with the last several speakers about the sidewalks and the streets, um, especially on 2nd Avenue in the 70s where I live. Um, I agree that we need neighbor responses and input regarding the changes and a regular evaluation because it's very difficult. I live on 72nd and 2nd and that's East 73rd Street corner and that whole area up to 76th Street is very hard to walk on. I wonder about our elderly residents, how they're able to get around on their walkers and things. I, I don't think that that's very comfortable for them. And I know there has to be a support of the business, but I agree with, um, I'm sorry, who was it said that maybe after a year or maybe even before that, we should reevaluate this and have a regular way of evaluating going forward. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. And then now, oops. Now we'll go to um, Valerie Mason. Hey. I got muted there for a second. I don't know. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I've always, I've been wondering, I've asked Keith Powers about this in earlier meetings, you know, uh, what does permanent mean when the council voted to, to make this all permanent? And I, I think, you know, look, it's still going to be a while before we get back to normal, as Michelle said. And this is the time to evaluate all of these spaces. You know, we could say that, you know, we grant you another license to do what you're doing for another, maybe, you know, till the next summer or whatever it is, that, you know. And during that time period, the various city agencies should be going around as well as other groups to take a look at what is being used everywhere and see what what can be done. I, I, I mean, it is it is just mind boggling to me that a restaurant that has 10 in, that has basically on a, before COVID could see 10 people is now because of circumstances well beyond anybody's control seating you know 60 people outside their restaurant because of taking two corners and a street and and a sidewalk i mean that just seems really unfair and the idea of permanent permanent for who permanent for the person who has the restaurant lease does that become attached to the to the landlord's property i mean as far as the city goes I mean, we're going to have to be evaluating how we're going to keep this city moving. We can't be giving away public spaces for free forever. 
I, it, it just it seems mind boggling that that would be the the solution. And I think also, um, you know, I, I can understand I, a kudos to many of these restaurants who've built some really nice spaces. Other people have built rather shabby ones, but some people have really put a lot of time, effort and money into those. And if it was deemed that this wasn't permanent, I mean, this is an extraordinary circumstance, I think, because I'm not sure that I believe this should be permanent. There should be some mechanism where whatever was spent by these restaurant owners could be taken as a tax credit if they have to if they have to take them down so that they're in no worse position than they were when this all started. And that should be the what, what the city is considering now, not just moving, you know, slapdash to make everything permanent but really look and see how this is all gonna to come together. I mean, the loss of parking revenues for the city is not offset by the, by the restaurant income in these parking spaces. I mean, that evaluation has to be done. And I don't see our mayor having any thoughtfulness except saying, oh, this should be permanent. Um, and that's not the way that this should be done. I mean, nobody should be penalized for what's happened and the restaurant should try to get back as soon as they can but they shouldn't have done this under false circumstances that this is going to be able to stay out there forever because there are too many constituencies that have to be that have to be compromised and number one is you know the pedestrian on the sidewalk We're, we cannot make our sidewalks larger but we seem to be giving it up for free to way too many people and that's all i'll say about it thank you valerie um, uh, let's see, let's go to Marco, who kindly put his hand down before and lost his place in line. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Um, uh, my point is, uh, I did a uh, 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 brief research, um, uh, uh, probably about two months ago, and I found that city planning, they did also a, a a research about how they do in or how many restaurants were open in the Upper East Side. It came to 72%. And if you remember very well, you and I, we were in a meeting where about a report of the, the restaurants. And they told us that the vacancy rate in that period of time was 12%, so 88%. So relatively, it's not bad our business in our community. They didn't close. Why? Because in our community, most of the families, they buy the, from the restaurants, few people cook at home. So uh, the, 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 the small business that has been disappeared drastically, especially from 86 to 96th Street on First Avenue was the supporting businesses. And you see in that area completely almost empty the, 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 the commercial spaces. So my point where I'm trying to reach is if they want to make permanent, how are they going to resolve the building codes? Because uh, those places, it will become uh, a fire hazard conditions for the public, for the buildings. And then that is going to affect the insurance. Uh, who's going to be liable for the, for the, for the liability? Something is happening in those places because I, I'm guessing the insurance just only covered the building, no outside of the building. So these uh, issues are extremely important in order to say, let's go make a uh, uh, permanent uh, uh, um, structures outside. We have also to analyze the streetscape, the quality of our streetscape which is basically unique on the Upper East Side. Uh, probably in, in other neighborhoods, it fits very well. But in our neighborhood, we have to maintain that level because at the end of the day, those residents are paying for that service. And in, in the Upper East Side, they provide a lot of income to the city, either in income tax or in real estate taxes. So we have to be very sure that this, this decision it cannot be quick and fast because of uh, maybe for political reasons or something like that. Or maybe he's in a hurry because we're going to do something because he, he's going to leave the, at the end of this year. And I think it's wrong a, a politician to make this kind of decision, especially if he's leaving. If he could have 
four more years, maybe yes. But in this case, he's leaving. But he want to leave the promise for the other um, politicians that are going to follow up. I don't want to go in that direction, by the way. But the point is, what's going to happen in the t uh, at the time when there is a fire? How are you going to heat it, those places? Those places, they're supposed to be heated in order to accommodate the, the people. It has to condition on those spaces. And that creates the problems of electricity, it's probably the gas service. So this, this is not a very simple idea to say, let's go start and do it something new. I think it's wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. And actually, you make a very good point about the the, the sort of safety, the building code safety of these um, uh, so-called temporary structures. Uh, and so next, let's go to Craig. Hi there again. So um, first, I guess I have a general comments and slash perhaps question. Mm -hmm. I want to just understand, because I don't know that I, I'm really sure what it is. I, is there a distinction between sidewalks and streets in terms of how it relates to zoning? I know that was something that we've touched upon in the past, but I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that zoning was implemented on major cross streets because of concerns about maintaining pedestrian flow or if it was because of quality of life concerns. And then I keep going back to the whole discussion regarding mansion. Um, which we all remember. And, um, but I, I have to say that street activity over there um, or the, the activity of, of the new sidewalk cafe and open restaurant, I think that's really enhanced the community experience and added a vitality um, over in that area, especially around a construction zone that has existed there over the past year. And Based on that location, I'm not sure that pedestrian activity was clearly a factor in the original zoning um, and it, and no sidewalk cafe is being allowed on that far side of 86th Street all the way further east. So I guess that's something I'm trying to understand. Beyond that, um, I don't think it would surprise anyone to find out that I'm supportive of the concept of making the open restaurant program permanent. So I guess my take on this is that we we're, we talk about returning to normal, but as I like to say, let's not assume that the old normal will be the new normal. Um, there are aspects of life that are just going to be changed for years to come. And I think the majority of our community is on the side of changes that has been implemented as part of open restaurants, even if it doesn't seem to be a majority of those who are um, who are speaking tonight. So I think we need to face the reality that open restaurants is almost certainly in all of our futures. So, I mean, that being said, I mean, clearly the current program, the makeshift program is not ideal and we definitely need better oversight and clear guidelines to ensure that the program can be made permanent in a way that balances needs and assures that pedestrian clearance is maintained and the pedestrians can be kept safe and that we're sensitive to specific corridors or districts where um, there may be valid reasons to restrict the program and just an overall um, being making sure that this does enhance the quality of life. But I don't think we could just argue that competing interests regarding street and sidewalk use and concerns about parking in a district where, I mean, let's let's face it, only about a quarter of residents own vehicles here. Not true. And that, that's, a, if you look at the census data- That's um, not true. Hold it up, that's it's 28% vehicle ownership rate in the Upper East Side. Um, so I don't think that so that's that means sufficient. Wait, 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 Valerie, Valerie, we can't do that. Let him uh, well, I mean, it's not true. I'm not it's gonna okay, let him Valerie. that's not true. But just let but him finish and let, then you could point yeah, that please, out. Please, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. So I just don't think that that's a sufficient reason to oppose, oppose the program from being um, a permanent fixture of New York City life. And we can't just assume that the permanent program can't have guidelines that preserve necessary parking and sidewalk space to accommodate pedestrian activity. Um, we also just need to make sure that in any, per in any program that we, I mean, we have to find 
again, the word balance comes to mind. Um, and in general, just, I think we need to evolve as a neighborhood in a city with the times. And I think clearly open restaurants is, is our future. Um, so I know that it's not a popular opinion here, but I just want to make sure that the other side is, is heard. Thank you, Craig. Just, j just one, one comment. Um, the mayor's initiative is not designed to create a, um, a, regulatory, uh, a regulatory framework for open restaurants, but in fact, to remove whatever, what few regulatory, um, uh, uh, what little re regulatory oversight is now in place. The point is to make it easier to the point, uh, make it easier to do these things rather than make it harder. The whole point of the mayor's initiative was to quote, cut through the red tape and make things easier to do. And that isn't necessarily a good thing. And I think Marco's, to Marco's point and the point that all the others have made is not so much that, um, that sidewalk cafes are a bad thing. We all have opinions about sidewalk cafes in New York City but that the, that the semi, the temporary structures would now become permanent structures unregulated by the Department of Buildings or the Department of Transportation or anything. Can, can I just respond to that quickly? Because I think this is where there may be a disconnect and we may be a little premature in this at, at this stage of the game and trying to discuss this because my understanding is that there is going to be a permanent program that is developed that here we're really talking about whether the current underlying zoning restrictions on, on sidewalk cafes and outdoor dining are going to be overall lifted, but that not at the expense of a program that is more well thought out and designed to be able to work permanently without the permanent structures as they are now necessarily and without the haphazard manner in which things came up and without regards to certain areas where undoubtedly people have had at negative experiences because of the way in which it was rushed. But I, m my discussions when I've heard from DOT was that they're going to be working on this to make, make everything work better. And the zoning text amendment is, would be essentially the mechanism to open it up further. I don't know that it would necessarily mean everywhere, but I think there are political statements. And if the mayor said that about cutting red, red tape, I don't know if that was just uh, just him just speaking off the cuff or if that was really what he meant, but I don't think that is the reality. And what I've heard through the grapevine is that that isn't- Greg, excuse me, reality. we can't, we can't, we can't, just as you suggest that we can't assume um, bad motives or lazy motives, we also can't assume that everyone um, uh, thinking about this is on the side of the angels. And so let's speak to maybe, um, uh, let's see, Valerie, I know, wanted to say something about car ownership that I probably well, personally agree with. Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think that census data is correct because the people who have cars in New York not only own them, they lease them. And so there's a distinction there. And secondly, at least on the Upper East Side, the amount of people who own cars is, you know, if, even if it's 30% or 35%, I think it's actually higher than that. But that's not really the point. I think the point is the one that you were making, Anthony. I don't think anybody who spoke before Craig was saying that they were against these open restaurants the way they are now. But you are exactly right, Anthony. The mayor has said he's going to make these structures permanent 
without regard to any existing zoning or any other laws that we have. I mean, Marco points out safety codes, et cetera. And again, I go back to the, I'll call it, I don't know, whatever, however lengthy the word is, enforcement. The DOT has not done any enforcement with respect to any of the structures that are out there. And if even if you were gonna make something permanent, you would have to have a dedicated, some force to walk around and make sure what is happening. All I'm, all I'm saying, and I think a lot of the people on this Zoom call are saying is, we need time. To your point, Craig, I think you're actually agreeing with us that you need to look at what regulations and what has to be put in place to make some of this work for everyone. You can't, you know, what's happening now is I see restaurants putting up, taking more space with the idea, again, that there's some kind of land grab going on here because they've heard from the mayor that this is going to be permanent. So they want to be in a really good bargaining position to take up as much space as they possibly can, whether it's parking space, space on the sidewalks, right near my house. Uh, one of the restaurants has done this beautiful bench inside the tree pit. I mean, nobody has even <laughs> said anything. I mean, it's beautiful, but it's not their property. And they put this beautiful teak bench inside of it. I mean, it looks great, but you know, it, it's just, it's the mayor talking without thinking, plus the fact that his administration is ending soon. So permanent for him means, you know, the end of December 31st. But you know, I think that this is the time where we have to look at all this and we cannot be blind to the fact that this city is somehow going to have to raise money to keep the city going. And we can't be giving away public property in perpetuity for free because that's what it is right now. We cannot sustain that. And, and we can help our restaurants get back on their feet and figure out a way but this can't be like a land grab taken due to circumstances beyond anybody's control. And then when the music stops, this is all mine and I have it for free forever. That, 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 can't, that can't work that way. <laughs> I don't think that's what the intention was. I think we're all, I, I, I think we're being a little cynical if we really think that it's going to just, turn out that everything as it is now is going to be what we see going forward and that it's going to be a land grab without any regulation and without this, the city getting involved in making sure that there are real standards in place. I mean, well, maybe I'm, I, I, I could be wrong, but I have a hard time believing that uh, in a functional governing um, city, and yes, I, I shouldn't say that because I'm sure people don't think we're functioning right now, but that, that it's, it's not going to be the permanent structures that are, that are in place now, but it's going to be something else that when a restaurant comes in, they'll have the ability to, to apply and, be, and participate in a program and to have to report on it and so on and so forth. And I mean, when, when this Craig, whole thing began, Craig, I was talking me. about the concerns about winners and losers because there were all these restaurants that are starting behind the eight ball and couldn't participate in the program, whether it was because there are hydrants or other safety concerns, narrow sidewalks, bike lanes, whatever they may be, bus lanes. And I think it would be hard to imagine that we're, that a program is going to be built that can't be equitable in, in some way, I, or at least I hope that would be the case. Anyway, I don't want to dominate this. I thank everyone for listening to me. <laughs> okay, um, we have uh, costs now. Yeah, if we remember correctly, this thing was started last year, around about June, after about a three months lockdown, and. Um, the DOT put this plan in a haphazard way. Every second day, they changed the rules. It was going to be until I think it was about October or November. Yes. Then, then it was made permanent until 12 months after the COVID ended. So in the meantime, everybody did their thing. It's, it was good that 
restaurants were allowed to be on the street or extra on the sidewalk. But then at the same time, as Valerie said, some restaurants doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Some places even went five, six times the number of seats that they originally had. In the meantime, they were lucky enough to have the space, to have the area that they could acquire. Some other restaurants couldn't do it. They were behind the eight ball. Then in November, indoor dining was banned, but outdoor dining was allowed. But some of these places were considered indoor dining. No air circulation, no heat, no filtration. And at the same time, they were open with no enforcement. Indoor dining was banned, but these places were allowed to operate. So the ones that were lucky enough to be in the right place, the ones that were lucky enough not to be in the enforcement, not to be there to be stopped because of, of indoor dining. Now, they have the extra benefit of applying for the PPP because the PPP is based on three and a half times the monthly, the average monthly expenses of your salaries. So the places that were unlucky enough, they were open six months. So their average monthly is nothing compared to the ones that were open. So all this is, and people and some restaurants have taken over the complete sidewalk, permanent structure on the sidewalk. So you've got two, three feet of movement. And I downloaded the DOT uh, side of all the restaurants, inspections and everything. And I just forwarded to DET, you know, inspect these locations. DOT has done nothing. You know, you look at the downloaded um, inspection that the DOT has. There's places that have been inspected. There's three feet of space on the sidewalk. They're still permanently there. They're not going to be taken down. So this permanency will be there. However, it has to be equitable. For, for a restaurant that has four or five times the capacity, he's not, he's not hurting. He's, la he's laughing all the way to the bank. The, per the restaurant, the small restaurant that doesn't have the capability of expanding, that's the one that's hurting. So there should be an equality set up. If you're making extra money this year, then you pay for it. If you're making less money this year because you can't do anything to help you, then you get the help. That way, the ones that have made the money help the ones that have not made the money. And on a permanent basis, as has been said by several people, it's got to be equitable. It's got to be fair. It's got to be fair to the restaurants. It's got to be fair to the public. But at the same time, it also has to be fair to the boutique openers, the shops that are not restaurants, and they can't build on the sidewalk or in the street. So they're hurting. So I think this is the start of a long battle, but I think we should do it now and wait for the text amendment to come out and make sure that our voice is heard. Let's not leave it till the 11th hour, like some other functions that we haven't done, but we need to talk about this and we need forceful representation from the elected officials. Anyway, this will be going on forever. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Koss. Um, I, I'm going to, uh, let's see, uh, Gail has not spoken on this topic yet. Thank you. I agree with everything that Koss just said. Um, to me, we have to look at the necessity of regulatory oversight. Obviously, there's no one, I think, at this meeting that doesn't want to do the best that we possibly can for our restaurants. I mean, they're part of the lifeblood of the city. The restaurants are a major tourism magnet, which also brings money and revenue into all five boroughs. 
But the equity issue is what strikes me the most. I think that in the past, when you look at the fact that a lot of the restaurants, if they were going to have outdoor dining, they had to pay for a permit. So there were restaurants that were even penalized as COVID began and restrictions were in place because they had already paid for their annual permit. And as much as we like the idea of having these outdoor restaurants, not only does there have to be enforcement, there have to be regulations to ensure that they are safe, that codes are being met. And pedestrian flow is important. I see what Craig is saying, maybe it'll be a new normal, but if we're lucky, we're gonna see, and we're seeing now that more and more people who even had fled the city for months are back. More people are starting to go to their offices. So why do we penalize individuals who are walking on the street? And there are so many safety issues. There's so many things that have to be addressed. And I think enforcement is going to be critical. And if we start to look in general, we have not had regulatory oversight. We can understand why COVID was a very unique situation, but we can't look at that down the road and just say, there's gonna be a new future, which is wonderful. And everybody is gonna want these outdoor dining facilities. They're not gonna to wanna to park their car. I bet half of the people on this call own cars in New York City. So, you know, I think we have to balance all needs. We can't look at just one group, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to help the restaurants as best we can. And I think Kaz's idea of taking a look at the restaurants that were able to be open, that were fortunate enough to have generated enough income to have to have some way in which they contribute to the restaurants that were small, where the sidewalks weren't viable, outdoor tables. They couldn't get into the street. There were fire hydrants. <clears throat> so I don't think it's just a matter of great. Uh, let's just go ahead and do this. And to look at any zoning tax amendment changes, to me, that is such a slippery slope. That's all I have Thank to say. You. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. Wait, wait I have a um, question for Gail. Gail, when you say a slippery slope to look at the zoning text proposals, what do you mean? Do you mean for the city to be talking about a permanent text amendment? Well, or do you mean something else? I mean for the city to suddenly say, we're going to change the text amendments for restaurants. And then how does, you know, how does that really work? Mm -hmm. Particularly when there is not going to be enforcement, then you establish precedents. And the whole question is, what do we do where we help the restaurants? We all want that to be the case. We want them to survive and thrive, but not, you know, there's always this, let's throw this out. Let's, let's let this change. And what we're seeing is that zoning is critical and particularly in this time where there is that slippery slope and whether it's developers or anyone else wanting to just kind of push the envelope I'm not in favor of any type of zoning changes that can't be justified. And I don't think in this case they can. This whole process seems really rushed. And that's why I yes. had wanted to have this kind of meeting, even though the text amendment hasn't been proposed yet and we don't have specific language. It feels like it's enough that they are trying to do this to come out with the proposal before June um, in order to get it done before the mayor leaves office. And you're, it, you're right. Without, because it's a, it's a complicated issue. And to do it quickly and talk about all zoning throughout the city, possibly in one fell swoop, is it's just too fast. I think you're absolutely right about slippery slope. And that's a term lawyers use a lot. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it just feels like too much. So um, Anthony, I'll, I'll leave it there. I know I had my hand up, but, um, but that's what I wanted to say is that there is an urgency to putting the brakes on this, or there's an urgency to, to yelling at the city and saying, stop, you've got to consider a lot of other factors before they are able to start a Euler process on this. Well, I, I, I guess, um, let's see, we have one more first time speaker um and you have and two then, you have elizabeth ashby and billy. oh elizabeth as well all right so let's uh start with billy and then elizabeth yes long time listener first time speaker uh this evening at least um yeah i'll just try to keep this pretty brief um 
this does seem a little drastic to do a, a zoning text amendment to, to make this permanent. I mean, I if I had my druthers, we would look as a city about at how we use all this public space and we would ask ourselves, okay, Third Avenue, we have outdoor dining, but should there be, for example, a bike lane, protected bike lane? Should there be a better ded dedicated bus lane? I don't know the answers to those questions. I'm gonna have opinions about them, but I guess I'd like to see the city really evaluate how we're using all this space. I mean, I want to back up Craig for a minute. 75% of the space in New York City is devoted to cars, either driving lanes or parking lanes. And he's right about the data. I guess we can ask whether the census looks at, you know, owning and leasing is interchangeable, but 22% in Manhattan own a car. And if you also look at the data, 6% use a car to commute. It goes up to 8% if you look at uh, carpooling. Um, so, you know, most folks are not, for example, driving to work in a car. I mean, these are real, like, big issues and real questions that I think warrant not such a rushed approach by the city. Um, and again, if I had my way, you know, I would extend outdoor dining as is because we're still in the midst of a pandemic. We, I think we all want to help these businesses. But I guess this is my take on it. And I probably haven't added anything new or valuable, but um, I, I do think I'd like to see the city look more widely. And if we were going to, I don't know if we're looking to pass a resolution tonight, but that's the, the type of position I would hope we'd take as a community board. You know, let's reevaluate how we use the space. Let's have what the Municipal Arts Society has called for, a director of the public realm and someone to kind of consolidate and coordinate, you know, how we use our public space among the agencies. Um, that's sort of how I'd want to approach this. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Billy. Oh, uh, Billy, um, can I add something onto what Billy said, which is just wait till there's congestion pricing and we see all the cars circling CB8 and CB7 because they don't want to pay the toll to go below 60th Street and how that's going to add to the traffic with the open restaurants and the bike lanes and the bus lanes and the double park trucks, to say nothing of, it, of everyone else using the streets. So I just had to throw in the congestion pricing because yes, they, did, they, are, they are moving on it. In, in yes. the interest of everyone's evening, I'm going to leave it there. But Alita knows <laughs> I have a response to that. Yes, Billy and I have had lots of conversations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth. Yes, I think that uh, every objection uh, that people have made tonight will be invaluable, but in my opinion, only invaluable in the future. Uh, we we are now in the middle of a pandemic. There's not a person on the board who can reliably predict the future, as far as I know. And I think to, to make a change of this sort uh, at this time, however good, bad, or indifferent it is, uh, isn't all that bright in the head. We have to get through the pandemic then we have to see how things turn out. I think we've done the right thing by helping restaurants in this terrible time. All for it. The, uh, their, uh, the expression goes permanent for eight, six months and then permanent for a year. But uh, permanent, as most of the people understand it, uh, is something one shouldn't do at a time like this. And I think that everything that's been said, it would be useful when we, if this comes up, but I, I personally, I don't care what the text is and we don't know what the text is. I think that it should not be considered at this moment. I think it's a terrible time. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, and it, in, in fact, that that's a wonderful lead in. I was, um, uh, Alita and I have been furiously texting back and forth on this. And I wonder if there is an, if there is an appetite for a resolution uh, this evening, and Billy brought it up, um, on this particular topic and um, wondering if someone wanted to propose one. Elaine and Valerie have had their you hands mean up, Anthony, so I don't know if their hands are yeah. still up in relation to your question or on comments that they had wanted to make. So let's start with Elaine and then Michelle. Well, I wasn't going to do a resolution, but let me make one and then speak to it. I will try. 
um, resolve that CBA does not support any zoning changes in relation to outdoor dining, whether it is on streets that permit outdoor dining or not, until we have a comprehensive review of the unintended consequences of any type of action moving forward. Thank you. Um, I, I know you want to speak to it. Uh. Oh, yes, I did. Okay. Um, part of it goes to each community is different. We have zoning that covers different communities. Within our own community, we have a range of whether it's a C82 or an R8B or an R10, but they're different to meet different needs. So I don't see how this city could do any kind of zoning change that would be the same for each community. I think the zoning should remain grassroots, not what the current speaker has put out with planning together or anybody else. My concern is we need to look at competing interests. There's been major coverage with the outdoor dining that when they're on the street and you have a bike lane, the bikes are going so fast that restaurants have attempted to put slow down, stop, and even bumps, which the DOT now has opposed in certain areas. It is a danger. We need to have a comprehensive plan that impacts disabled, old people, young people, families, in how we all use our streets. Restaurants have been impacted, but so has every other small business. The other small businesses weren't told you can put your clothing hanging out on the avenue like we did a hundred years ago. That's not the answer. The answer is looking at how we creatively put together all the needs of the people. One thing we need to look at is, gee, why are the, resident, res, uh, the restaurants in such dire straits? One is their own rent. So let's look at what we've been doing since Ruth Messenger was borough president, commercial rent control. So we need to look at everything before we say to one specific part of our community, this is what will help you. Because without looking at the impact on others, we hurt the rest of the community. And I'm very upset about that. I don't want to get into, if we're going to have quality of life, let's get DOT to do the goddamn curb cuts right, okay? I can tell you everyone where I've had to help an elderly person stuck because they couldn't cross because they got stuck in a poor curb cut. And it happened the other day. And I was with somebody else who looked at me and went, you I said, how do you think she's going to cross the street? And she couldn't get up the other side. So this is not just about saving one part of our community. It's how do we save us all? And let's put that together and stop the vested interests on bikes or any. And I'm going to raise my voice because I am had it now with the bikes thinking they control all. Well, the restaurants now have stopped. Would you please slow down in their lanes? OK, as they come out from the restaurant over the sidewalk, have to cross the street and get to their outdoor restaurant because their people are getting hit. So let's not rush. 
I agree. This is moot for the current administration. Most of us are here for the long term. So let's do a comprehensive look at whatever decision is made. We need to also include unintended consequences. And I can think of a lot of them. So, you know, I'm frustrated with this. I, I've seen what the restaurants are doing. They've taken over the storefronts of empty stores, not the storefronts, but the street. Whoever said it before. Yeah, it's like out of control. But they're not the only industry that hurts. And we have to help the other industries too. Sorry. Thank you. Thank not you, Elaine. Is there, now there's a motion on the floor. I, know, I won't forget you, Michelle. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I see Marco. Okay. Oh, and um, Gail. Okay. Um, all right. So before it, we do been... that, Anthony, can someone texted me and asked if, and because I don't know if this is relevant, if the city council passed legislation on this point. So I just chatted Will to ask him about it specifically. The person said there was, who's at the meeting said that there was something in the chat about it. And, and, and if they did, then, um, then maybe that needs to be included in the language of the, of the resolution if it's relevant here. I, I just don't know because I, I can't read that during a meeting. I, I believe that, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to Will, but I believe that what Keith Power said at our last meeting that the city council had proposed the permanence of the, of the open street program. Right, but that's not specific, right. He did say that, but that's not specifically about changing the zoning or writing or, I mean, it's not their jurisdiction. But I know, it, it but wasn't... That, that's as specific as the mayor saying, you know, he's going to cut out. All, well, Michelle looks like she has some <laughs> she has some information. She does. I don't know that I have information, but I would just like to say this. You know, my concern, I have other things to say, but my concern with the resolution is that it's it's saying that we would look at this, we just want to wait and hear the other, you know, and add in all the parameters. My personal feeling is I don't want a resolution and I don't want to consider all the other parameters. And for me, a resolution would have to list every single point in the whereases that was made tonight. And that doesn't, and, and it's sort of silly for me to think, I mean, this is like never let a crisis go to waste. Somebody jumped on this because we're in the middle of a crisis. And there are people who think that the zoning resolution is fluid, that we change it, you know, whenever we want to. But I don't believe that it's fluid. I think when it's changed, there has to be a very good reason. I have no confidence in the powers that be that came up with this because the very fact that they propose that this be permanent instead of saying going to Andrew's point and maybe what, uh, I don't know what Matt was thinking about. I know the restaurants are thriving under these circumstances, but they were doing very well before the pandemic. But to say not to go to the word permanent before saying let's con let's extend it a year, let's then evaluate and, and have the option to go another year. Let you know there was no rational thinking to jump to the word permanent and all the ramifications that that entails. And if we are thinking that only we could see the pitfalls and that the whole city council, this was lost on the mayor, the city council, all of the uh, the city organizations, that nobody else could think, could think of the issues that we raised tonight. Um, that tells me, because I know they definitely thought of all of the issues that we are raising tonight, that tells me that this is an irresponsible proposal um, and, and um, we have no evidence. Somebody has said, well, you know, only the people on this call, they seem to object to it, but many, many people like this. We have no study. We, have, we don't have any study saying that a lot of people are for this. Um, not to extend it in a, in a uh, you know, a proportional time frame makes absolutely no sense. I have no confidence that in the city that this will be handled in a rational way. I have no confidence that they will come up with rules to address it because the rules that are currently addressing it 
is the zoning resolution. So what makes you think they'll eliminate the zoning resolution and then rule by rule by rule by property by by um, district by whatever they're going to come up with brand new rules that's going to work better than the zoning resolution that is not going to happen my feeling is we have to vote this down listing all of our whereases um, for the reasons and just vote it down and and withdraw the words if if uh, Elaine is uh, this is a friendly amendment if we're going to even have a resolution and the whole thought of that isn't withdrawn but to withdraw the part that says until such time that this evaluation that evaluation that is never happening because if it hasn't happened up until now and all these people could sit around and vote for this without anything in place i mean we have in place what's addressing this um so that's my suggestion uh either either withdraw the resolution or if you want a resolution to just say we oppose it with no qualifications but list every single whereas that we said tonight which can be found if we listen, if whoever's taking the minutes listens to the um, the tape, the recording, and can put them all down, but otherwise, with without that, with, with a qualification until such time, I think that's very dangerous because it shows that we're open to it. Okay. Um. Okay. Um. Oops. Elaine put her hand down. Oh, she's waving. Elaine, uh, oh. Okay. Huh. I didn't put it down. Okay. Okay. I don't know what happened. Yeah. I'm open. I, I, I was caught off. I put something on the floor for us to discuss. If the committee wants to just wrote, vote it down, I'm not opposed. I think what I was trying to lay out is a map for the city to function in a more cohesive manner. Mm -hmm. But knowing, as Michelle does, what doesn't go on is I would accept a friendly amendment to oppose what Ever the city is putting forward because we haven't seen the text amendment and ask that they come to each community to discuss ramifications. And Michelle, does that meet your request? Um, uh, let's unmute Michelle. Actually, Elaine, I would like it even stronger. I okay. would like, I would like, because the reason is it's, it's unbelievable to think that they came up with this and nobody thought, you know, the word permanent, permanent, permanent forever, permanent. They had so many other options yes. that they could have done, you know, they, to satisfy everybody. If they came out and said they're extending it for a year, um, the restaurants would have been perfectly happy. We would have been, okay, good. They're extending it for a year. We're going to reevaluate. Nobody would have been hysterical. They chose that word. And you're talking about a city council of 50 people. You're talking a speaker. You're talking a mayor. You're talking all the city agencies, the DOT, uh, you know, consumer affairs. So you're talking about everybody. And this is what they came up with. This does not inspire uh, trust on my part. My feeling is, as I stated, I want no qualifications in, in it, if that's okay with you, Elaine, to just say we are opposed to the permanent to the permanent uh, instating of the open restaurants. But I want the whereases, all 2,000 of them, <laughs> you know, to be uh, in, in the resolution. And the reason I say that is because that indicates that we, in fact, gave it some thought. 
the okay. whereas is will tell the powers that be, and we should send this to everybody, including the other community boards and the borough president and everybody else we can think of, that will tell them that community board eight thought about this because here's our concerns, this whereas and that whereas and this whereas, and that also implies that the administration et al did not think about anything like that. So to me, that's what I would like to see with no, I don't want them coming from community board to community board and with presentations. It implies to them that there's an opening here. There are no rules and regulations that they could put in place that will be fair to everybody including pedestrians and all of the resident, residents, not just restaurant and zone owners, that will be any better than the current zoning resolution. Michelle, if they're, if, if they're not coming to the boards and they are trying to get this text amendment and going right into ULERP, will you lose any opportunity to comment? And if the committee wants to make a comment through a resolution, then, then maybe this, the sooner the better, if that's what people well, are interested yes. in. Yeah, uh, well, I agree, but I think the comment is the resolution, and that's why I'm stressing the whereases. You don't need the yes. comments on the comments on the comments. You know, the, this is if we have a strong resolution in opposition for the 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 the, the following reasons, which is the whereases, uh, that tells them we discussed it. We thought about it. Here are the pitfalls that we find. We find that it made no sense for them to go to a permanent situation without an incremental uh, situation, which I believe would have satisfied many. You can't tell me that the restaurants would have been unhappy and, and stamp their feet and say, no, 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 not another year. We want it permanent. Nobody would have done that. I don't know who pressured them uh, to do this. Um, I see Jessica's hand is up. I would love to hear, I mean, her input. But anyway, yeah. from the standpoint of the resolution, if that's a friendly amendment that Elaine is willing to accept, that's, I, I don't see any downside to going that way. I do have to I, thank Michelle, Je I think I, that's fine. Oh. And I'm I sorry, think Elaine... I just wanted to thank Jessica for being so patient because she's here for the next small business item. Yes. And um, uh, I'm sorry, Alita, I didn't mean to step on your no, line. I I'm stepped just... on yours first and twice, okay. so thank you. All right. Elaine seemed to indicate it was okay. Yes, I mean, look, I'm open. Yes, it's good. That we have a community that respects our zoning and that does not willy nilly and I don't mean that in the sense some people, oh, no, that it hasn't been thought through. I, uh, so I support Michelle. The other thing I would say, in addition to the resolution, I'd like a letter to go out immediately to uh, the powers that be. The letter to me has always been a much stronger venue to get to government than a resolution that they don't respond to. They respond to letters. So I would like to make it in a letter, okay? And I accept, Michelle, thank you. Um, I put it on the floor. I had no ownership uh, and I'm grateful for the input from all of you. So thanks. Okay, um, that's fine. So letter and resolution um, appears to be, what. yes, Michelle, thumbs up. Okay. Um, is someone eager to call the question? Elaine appears to have called the question. Call the question. Thank you, Elaine. Second, someone. Feels like. Oh, I see Michelle. Michelle. And oh, Valerie. Okay. Valerie, yep. All right. Um, all those in favor, this is the calling the question part. Um, if anyone is opposed, if we could take down the hands, uh, well, they're not board members, so it's okay. Um, Wait, Anthony, before you do that, let's just make sure we have all of the board members on the call. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, so I'm just reading from the list. We have um, Elizabeth, Ashby, Valerie, Billy, Kaz, Craig, Elaine, Gail, Marco, Michelle. Is there anyone that I've missed? 
I don't see anybody else. I guess not. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Anthony. Uh, okay. You have Anthony as well, obviously. Right. And me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you, Alita. Okay. Um, so in terms of calling the question, those who are in favor or I guess opposed either way, opposed, let's say a show of hands, none. Oh, Craig is opposed, maybe? Correct, I'm opposed. To calling opposed the question, the... Craig? Oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I thought this was- That's calling the question. Okay, so we are calling the question and now we are voting on this resolution to um, oppose the change in zoning, the language to be worked out through the um, uh, uh, review, endless review of the tape. So um, as we've customarily done, those who are opposed, please raise your hands. Oppo uh, actually, it was opposed, abstaining, or not voting for cause. And Craig, you are opposed. Right. Yes, okay. Um, otherwise, uh, the motion carries and we can now um, let Jessica speak. So thank you for the zoning committee for participating in the, in the combined joint uh, meeting. And Jessica, thank you so much for your patience. And Valerie, do you want to uh, take on agenda item three? Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I, I'm just going to throw it open to, to Jessica. She's been waiting too long. So Jessica, again, thank you for being so patient and the floor is yours. Tell us why you're here tonight. We're happy to change topics. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you. This has actually been a, a terrific conversation for me to listen to. So thank you to all of you. Um, and I know that you, you do this all the time and, and give up your time. So thank you so much uh, for all that you do. Um, so I'm Jessica Walker, the president of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, of course, we, we represent the business community across the borough. Uh, as of late, we have been extremely focused on the city's economic recovery, and in particular uh, on small business survival. Uh, I won't go too far into the stats, but um, it's, it's a trying time, and I know that you, you all know that. Uh, and, and Manhattan is really ground zero. Um, for a lot of reasons, but but essentially, you know, all of the small businesses are concentrated in Manhattan, uh, and of course, you know, the impacts of of the diminished tourism and office workers and uh, so many residents who have left uh, really hits Manhattan. So we really are ground zero. Uh, I come before you tonight because I am requesting a letter of support for a new project we're looking to launch. Uh, we have. Uh, submitted a formal request to Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney uh, for funding, uh, community project funding. And uh, so we, we're, we're asking for a letter of support. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through the different components and happy to answer any questions. Um, so, so as I noted, um, you know, uh, Manhattan is ground zero. And I think you're all aware that we're already starting to see uh, the storefront vacancies creep up, uh, which is uh, certainly concerning. Um, the stats show that about half of all of the city's small businesses are now closed. We hope that some of those are temporarily closed and that they're going to come back, but, but it's still pretty uh, concerning. Um, uh, I know Matt is on the, on the Zoom. Uh, Madison Avenue between East 57th and East 59th Street had a astounding ground floor uh, vacancy rate of nearly 40% at the end of the year, at the end of 2020. Uh, Soho has also, they're at about 30% vacancy. Um, and so we're just very concerned. I've also, I could tell you that also, you know, I've seen quite a bit of vacancy on the, uh, in East Harlem as well. Um, and I'm really concerned about what's gonna happen when the governor's eviction moratorium expires. Right now it's set to sunset uh, on May 1st for commercial, um, uh, commercial spaces. Uh, it might get extended, but it might not. Um, and I, I can tell you that, um, you know, there are a lot of businesses who are in arrears at this point, lots of restaurants, um, you know, they're trying to do their best, but a lot of them are in arrears. So we don't know what's gonna happen when that eviction moratorium goes away. Um, 
So what we would like to, and, and one more thing before I jump into sort of what this project would do. The other thing is, of course, we are really working right now. We are, we need to bring back our remote workers and tourists. Uh, and so it's a terrible time. It's, it's always a bad time to have, uh, you know, vacancies and the blight of vacancies uh, and not being able to have stores that you need in your community. But it's, it's doubly troublesome now when we're trying to bring people back because we need that vibrancy. We need to remind people what's so great about New York. Uh, so that's, that's critical, a critical component of what we're trying to do. We call the project the, um, the Manhattan Storefront Revitalization and Small Business Entrepreneurship Project. <laughs> it's, it's a mouthful, uh, but it has three big components. Um, so first, the first thing that we wanna do with the project is really use data mapping to understand where the vacancies are. Um, uh, as you know, the city council led on by Gil Brewer uh, did push through a vacancy registry. We're hoping that, that they're gonna put out the first results uh, in June or July of this year. The, the deadline for, for buildings is at the, towards the end of June. So hopefully we'll get that over the summer. So that will give us sort of a picture of the vacancies, but we're not sure, it's the first time. So we're not sure uh, how great that data will be, um, but we're gonna use, take that uh, and some other data that we've uh, been working on. And what I wanna do is, is just put, put interns out throughout the borough to really get a sense of what's happening. Uh, so we want to just sort of look through, over the summer about, uh, we want to look at where the vacancies are, where the troublesome areas are that we, we really need to be mindful of. So the first part is data, really understanding the problem. And we want to do that quickly. Uh, second, once we've identified the areas we really want to focus on where there's a lot of blight, um, we want to work with uh, the local community boards and the bids and merchant associations to figure out what, you know, what temporary installations they might like to see in those uh, vacancies. Because what the, the goal here is until we're able to get uh, long-term tenants, we want to uh, use some creative means to, to you know, put some, cre to put some solutions into those vacancies. So it could be an art installation, it could be a project demo, it could be a company coming in uh, short term, but we want to work with the local community to, to vet what, the, what those things could be and really try to fill those vacancies on a short term basis. Uh, and again, that's all, that's all to, to keep the, the city's vibrancy going as we're trying to bring everybody back because uh, it's just not a good time to have all those vacancies. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, what we want to do is really provide a suite of services to uh, entrepreneurs who are looking to launch businesses, uh, particularly those that could turn into storefront businesses. Um, so some of you might know the chamber's been working um, with the other chambers, the other borough-wide chambers and the Partnership for New York City with a fund from the Peter uh, Peterson Foundation. Um, and that allowed us to put uh, staff members on the ground. They're going door to door throughout Manhattan right now uh, to help small businesses survive. So that's helping them with financing, uh, helping them do their applications for PPP, whatever it takes to, to really help them survive. Uh, so we sort of already have the model, uh, but it's really, that's really focused on small business survival. What I'd like to do with this new project is to get more staff members who are focused on people who want to start a business, the entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's really where the job creation is going to come from. And honestly, I think that there's, uh, we're seeing an uptick in entrepreneurship right now. Um, you know, a lot of us have been sitting at home and we have, <laughs> you know, we have good ideas and now's the time to do it. And of course, some of it's necessity. You know, many people were laid off and they're starting a business, which is not a bad thing. Uh, so we want to harness that. Um, like I said, a lot of the job creation comes from uh, these younger businesses. Uh, so that's what we want to re really want to focus on. Um, we've had a lot of success. Like I said, uh, we've already through the small business resource network, we've already helped close to 12,000 businesses citywide working with all of the um, uh, all of the chambers. So we have had some success. And I, and I do think that, um, you know, that we have a strong foundation upon which to build. And like I said, I think that there's a great need because we want to, um, 
you know, we want to we want to be proactive in addressing vacancies before it gets out of hand. So I will stop there. I'm sure there are questions, uh, but again, I'm I'm seeking a, a letter of support if you think this is a uh, a good idea. Thank you. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'll handle it. I think. Uh... Just looking at the hands raised, Michelle, you want to go first? Sure. Thanks, Jessica. Oh, well, 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 I'm sorry. Now I see Matt. So let's take Matt first because he's a member of the public. And then we'll go to you, Michelle. Sorry. No, I just uh, just wanted to say thank you to all that the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce has been doing. Here is my letter of support, and I uh, <laughs> submitted it. And uh, uh, I just really appreciate all the work that you've done. And, and I think that we all have to say thank you for your work in our getting started uh, programs for small businesses a few uh, months ago during the summer uh, that, you know, Lita chaired. And uh, just really wanted to say thank you for all that you do. Uh, your seminars are still the, the, you know, our gold standard for uh, business support. So thanks again. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Okay, Michelle, we'll go to you. Thank you, sure. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions and then I, I have a suggestion actually. Uh, my question is, this is, you're applying for federal funds specifically for this program. And this is, is this separate from the funding that is already due to New York, coming to New York? Uh, yes, that's a great question. This is uh, a separate pot of money. Uh, this is the, uh, it's called the community project funding. So each, uh, each member of Congress was given a, a pot of money to distribute uh, to their local communities. Um, the applications pretty much have closed at this point. Um, uh, so, so yes, this is a separate pot of money. Uh, how much is it? We're requesting $800,000. Okay. And can you, before I have my suggestion, is there any money in, a, in any community or any fund that is currently left over in New York, uh, monies from the pot, the federal pot that we were given in the past? I don't know. Um, some of it, you know, a lot of it went to uh, the city and state uh, government to, to distribute. And, and we're still learning about that. I know there was a billion dollars, for example, put in for small businesses. And I think that uh, a large portion of that will go towards rent relief, but uh, we're still learning about how that money's gonna be spent. Okay, so we don't know if there's an overlap, but that's something you will find out or could find out? No, 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 I, I, I'm clear. This is, this is a separate pot of money um, uh, like I said, this is a specific okay. amount of money that each congressperson uh, is allowed to... Over and above anything else they were given. Okay. I think we have a natural constituency group that is just perfect for your project. And they claim to be entrepreneurs and they are small business people. And in many cases, most cases, quite successful. And that would be the street vendors. It would seem to me that this is a perfect, and I know you've come to our meetings, Jessica, and you know the issues that we have with street vending. I don't have to go into it now. We've been, uh, we've had a, ha we had to have had a hiatus on even discussing street vending because the administration lifted all rules and regulations that had to do with street vending. So there was no point discussing anything. Plus there is an intro with the city council that despite um, uh, many reservations that many of us have had, block associations, bids, community organizations, and even the veteran vendors who I have particular concern about and work with them. Um, but despite our reservations, it appears as though the city is going to go ahead with that. Um, how, how soon they're gonna actually put that I don't know, with all that's going on, maybe they're distracted a bit, but it looks as though that's happening. So having said all that, and because you're privy to our past conversations, as many of the people on this call are, I would love to see reaching out, maybe start with the veteran vendors, um, 
maybe going to the general vendors as they can go into premises that don't require specialization like ventilation for cooking. You know, the uh, food vendors, uh, they need a facility with the proper ventilation. There's no reason they can't share storefronts as they do their places on 8th Avenue and even in our neighborhood where you'll have uh, haagen -Dazs you know, sharing with Dunkin' Donuts or on 8th Avenue, there's actually a whole food court in, in front, you know, where many um, uh, businesses share a space. Now, is it going to cost a vendor more money than a $250 a year uh, permit? Yes, but they could probably make more money too. I don't know if subsidies are going to be involved. I, I don't know. I'm not here to work out the plan, but certainly that's a community that is sitting out there that has generated a lot of conversation in the rest of the community. They are also faced with often being non-compliant. They're faced with finding locations, which are not always an easy thing to do. And it just seems to me that, and rent could be commensurate with location, so that if you're on 86th Street, you might pay more than if you were on the corner of, uh, you know, First Avenue and uh, 71st Street, you know, whatever. I'm not, I can't figure out the program tonight, but what's your thought? I'm, I'm thinking that that certainly should be a community to reach out to. I know that the Street Vendor Project is a major representative of these vendors and may or may not be cooperative, but I also know that vendors are independent thinkers. They're out there in all kinds of weather, all kinds of hours. They face what's on the street, um, both the good and the bad. And I think that with the right program, you might be able to encourage them. I have one last thing I'd like to say to you. Your hand was up before we moved for this topic. So I think you probably had a comment on our last topic. And if you still would like to share it, I would like to hear it. So two things. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I totally agree with you on the point. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm so happy you raised that about the street vendors. I, I totally agree that that's a great place to start in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, and certainly some of the, you know, I've also been thinking about the, the organizations that provide micro grants uh, like Axion and, and uh, some of the others uh, as a place to start. But I think you're right on uh, and I appreciate that. Um, just quickly, it, the, the comment I was going to make before was just about, I just wanted to make sure as you craft your, um, uh, your your uh, letter um, uh, on the open streets issue, I just wanted you to be aware that uh, the Times Square Alliance has called for the next mayor to uh, create a, dep a deputy mayor for public spaces, which I thought was very clever. Uh, and that would be just one person who's, who's overseeing several, you know, holding, uh, overseeing the conversations of several different agencies to look at how we're using sidewalks and streets and parks uh, to coordinate it because everything is just so up in the air right now. So I just wanted, I just thought that that might be something you wanted to include. Okay, Actually, I don't, just to... in my personal opinion, I would not like to have that included in this resolution uh, because there is a danger of that being another layer of government. And also we haven't, with that, res with, with that issue, we haven't taken into consideration what the new city plan is, the planning NYC, which is going to have a lot of layers and uh, borough chiefs and councils and community boards. So I think for the purpose of our resolution, in my opinion, uh, we're okay with how it is. But I'm glad I wanted your feedback because I, I was dying to know what you wanted to say. So thank no, you. No, no, no. Thank you. I didn't. I didn't mean to bring it back up. I'm sorry, but no, no, uh, no, no I, I don't want to be able to Not you. I want that. I value your opinion. But Michelle asked for it. Gender, I asked for it exactly. That's fine. Can you address if if you think the vending thing is a good idea? How would you propose reaching out? Could you give us a little overview? I realize you haven't thought it all through, but a little conceptual sure. thing. Yeah. No. I mean, as as this legislation was was coming to a head in the last few months. Um, I've been speaking to to the street vendor project, you know, their their uh, their new president and, and whatnot. 
So we've had conversations. Um, they understand, you know, uh, again, uh, this has always been a tricky issue for us. We don't want to, we don't want to, um, the, the chamber, we're all about entrepreneurship and businesses. So we've never wanted to deny that to the street vendors. It was always about how the city is handling uh, the enforcement and, and the siting and all of that. So, so, you know, we made that clear and I think we do have a good relationship uh, with them. Certainly we're supportive of street vendors generally. Uh, it's always just been about how the city uh, uh, handles the situation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, thanks Thank for you. that, Jessica. I just want to move to give Billy an opportunity. You have your hand up, Billy, to ask a question. So go ahead. Well, I put my hand down actually because I, I wanted to maybe give others a chance to ask questions. I was going to say, you know, we should support this letter. I think it's really important. So thank you, Jessica, for being before us. And I don't think we should tweak it too much or offer our own thoughts in the resolution. I think we should support what Jessica presented us with and keep it straightforward. But maybe we go to Alita or anyone else who has questions first. Alita, did, well, did Thanks. you Thanks. I did. Thanks, Billy. Jessica, hi. Um, and just very quickly, Gail, Gail, I was going to say Barron, but she's a board member. Gail Brewer supports the idea of a public realm czar. So you, you may want to... Um, talk to her office about that. Um, I, I, I don't understand something about a uh, certain expenditure, which I wanted to ask about, which is um, if the city is releasing information about st storefront vacancies, which Gail Brewer has talked about on numerous occasions, what will your funding add to, um, to mapping out the, the vacancies if that's provided by the city. And if you've said that and I missed it, I apologize. I, I do sincerely apologize. No, it's a, it's a great question. So a few things. One, we're not sure. This is the first time they're going to have this data. So we don't know the quality of the data. Um, you know, there've been so many closures. Uh, we don't know, you know, what that data is going to look like. So it could be incomplete to not tell the full story. We're not sure. So that's one thing. Um, Basically, the, the again, this, this funding would do three things, but the first part is the data piece. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, there's a data set from a company that uh, essentially uh, mapped out all of the businesses in the city and it's frozen at a date of like November, 2019. So it's perfect for us to be able to go back and compare that data to now, because then it'll, it'll show the impact of, of COVID-19 on the, on the city's small businesses. So the thinking was that uh, we could just hire some temporary workers over the summer to walk the city and um, really take a look at what's open, what's not open. Uh, and I think that that will give us probably the most comprehensive view of vacancies that we've ever had. Um, listen, I, I do, I am hopeful. I hope that the, the vacancy registry is good and that's solid data and maybe we won't have to do that, that other piece. Uh, but again, I'm just a little skeptical since it's the first, the first round of data that they're probably gonna need to make some changes. It feels like the data, if you're just walking, if someone's just walking the streets and keeping track of which businesses are vacant or storefronts are vacant, is not going to be as, as complete without tracking the potential reason for the vacancy? Um, and was it because, because um, I don't know if, if landlords are holding on to properties because of their relationship with banks or just because they're hoping that rents will go up again or yeah. what's going on. Um, and then what do you do about, we've had a rash of new development on Second Avenue, for instance, Third Avenue. And while the individual, the storefronts they've replaced are a lot when, it, when it's a building that takes up half a block, but they're not, as, as you heard in that lengthy discussion earlier, they're not providing equivalent small spaces for businesses. So it, it, it's complicated, but I agree. If you, if you have that information from the other organization as to businesses in, in uh, November of over a year ago, that is a great reference point to work with. Um, I, I so much support doing whatever we can. And this reminds me a little bit, tiny little bit of Detroit after it went into bankruptcy, that it was able to attract artists. And even now that, that Shinola company put all, uh, nine, eight, nine, ten 10 figures into buildings downtown to revitalize that. Hopefully we're in better shape than a bankrupt city, but still. So okay. thank you for uh, 
tirelessly working on behalf um, of businesses uh, and right now the small ones. Sorry, Valerie. Okay. Um, oh, I just want to get to everybody. And I know, and I'm sorry for going that's on. That's right. Um, Elaine, um, do you have a question for Jessica? No, I was going to move to approve supporting the letter that- Okay, all right, let's just hold off. Kaz, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Go ahead. Um, Jessica, Con Ed has every single business location that has gas or electricity in the city, correct? Yes. Um Go so, ahead. so they know who has that store. If anybody's moved, can you get access to Con Ed who's moved and any, because they're not giving you any vital information. So there's no secrecy. It's just an address. And whether it's vacant and the, the current owner has it, yeah. wouldn't that help you? Uh, that's a great idea, and I actually will pursue that. Just so you know, though, the best data we have right now in terms of how many business small businesses are, have closed is using, um, there's a company called Wombly. <laughs> it's a strange name, uh, but they are tracking credit card transactions. Mm -hmm. And so businesses that have not made any credit card transactions in the last maybe three days are deemed closed either temporarily or permanently. And that's the best data that we actually have right now to show, it shows right now as of, as of March 31st that 50% of the city's businesses are not making uh, credit card transactions. Um, so there, uh, that, all of that is to say that there are businesses that, that can provide some of that information, um, but there, there's always, uh, some of it can be incomplete. Basically, right. what we want to do is, and again, I'm open to using all of these data sources, but I'm trying to get the most comprehensive uh, uh, overlook that we can. And, and, and in this mapping, we might you know, do overlays of different type of data, but the, the goal again is to identify the areas we really need to focus on. And then we'll, in the second step, put staff there uh, to get to know the landlords, work with the community boards and the bids to figure out what we can do uh, and sort of triage. But again, the, the, the focus here is one to, ident to sort of show the problem to everybody about where the, the, you know, the, the problematic areas are, but then move in there and really try to, you know, uh, fill those vacancies. Okay. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, a lot of other countries use barcodes for certain things. Has, have you thought of basically, um, having, you know, people or restaurants or um, businesses set up their barcodes and, and then you would know, or that would help? I think that's a, that's a good solution going forward. It's not set up now. Right, you know, yeah. We're still in survival mode here. So, um, but I think that's a smart thing to think about for the future because, you know, um, that would have certainly saved us uh, a, a lot of anguish. Uh, right. If we had that, you know, through this crisis. And also with contact tracing. And I mean, the rest of the world is using it. So why are we so far behind? Yes, in many ways. I mean, it's, yep. it's, so, it's so hard to get data. I mean, it really is um, about what's happening with vacancies. It's, it's ridiculous. And don't let the people uh, tell you that it's, you know, secrecy or uh, personal information. It's, it's just a number. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, cause on privacy law. I love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Marco, do you have a question for Jessica? Can we answer? Yes. Um, I think you should review the data for from the Department of City Planning. They did have a, a sample, a survey in our community from on Second Avenue from 86 to 79th Street uh, for different neighbors, and they divided in two or three categories. One of the categories is uh, restaurants. The other category is for, for other business, small business. And they went physically and they check uh, the spaces and then they have a report for, for, for that. Uh, what is most interesting in this process is they divide the, the, the type of services. In our community, obviously, the, uh, uh, the restaurants are doing very well, 
uh, it means at least they are open. That's the way I should say it, because I don't know financially how they do it. But uh, the other business, the complementary services, uh, they are gone completely, they are closed. So, um, uh, or there are the possibility that these restaurants, these uh, uh, complementary services, probably they are closed at a time when they, they, uh, they visit that place. So they make the reference and they make a good approach and a good assessment. Uh, I think maybe I think you should take a look at what CD Plan did in that direction. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the last two questions and then we're gonna vote on Elaine's motion. Um, my my first question is, I know that the application process has been closed and you said you made an application to Congresswoman Maloney. I was just curious if you made any other applications to perhaps uh, Congressman Nadler or any of the other Manhattan uh, representatives for anything? No, no, this is the only application. Uh, we want her to own it. Uh, we know this is an issue that's near and dear to her heart. So uh, so this is, this is the only application we put in. And then I just, this is, I guess, from my own personal opinion, I, I don't believe in unpaid interns. And I was curious what you're gonna be paying your interns. <laughs> I agree with you, Valerie. We're going to do twenty dollars an hour. Oh, that's good. Okay, that was my concern. Um, um, okay, great. Um, so, Elaine, let's go back to you. What's your, your is it the motion on the floor to uh, send a letter in support of this program? Do we have a second for that? I guess Marco's that's Marco's raising his hand. Marco. Okay. Um, I guess we have a motion to call the question. Okay. Elaine, yeah. Anybody? Okay, so um, all before that we vote, though, Valerie, just some people may have left, so I just want to go through the board members that I see on the participants okay. list again, if you don't mind. So okay. I see, um, I see Elaine, you, Billy, Cos, Craig, uh, Gail. I said Elaine, I think Marco, Michelle, and me. Am I missing anyone else? Okay, that looks so about Anthony, right to Anthony's me. left. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to use the approach that um, if you are not in favor of the motion or not voting for cause or abstaining, please raise your hand. Okay, it was worth waiting for, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> it always is. You have a unanimous support of the Small Business Slash Zoning Committee. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I'm very appreciative. And of course, if we're fortunate to get the funds, we will certainly return. Uh, we're gonna need your help to, to carry it out. Well, thank you very much for being so patient tonight and participating in all of our conversations. And as you can tell, we have a lot of ideas for how you can use the money that hopefully you will get. So please do come back and we always appreciate your input and, uh, and, and, and I'll echo uh, Matt, your seminars are the, are the gold standard. So thank you for joining us tonight. Do we have- are and if I could just add, Valerie, Jessica, we will be having other meetings on the open restaurants program and hopefully other ways to help small businesses. We welcome your, your attendance and your input at those meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I think, uh, yes, we have one. Okay, second. Okay, we have a second for Marco. Oh, Billy's in there too. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Call the question. <laughs> no, I don't think we need to do that. But okay, before, that for a motion before to we adjourn, adjourn that's correct. Yes, I should I, know that. I just um, want to say thank you, everyone, for your patience, for your enthusiastic participation in all of the important issues that we've had on the table this evening. So yeah. sorry to cut you off, Valerie. That's okay. I was just, just going to say thank you for a very lively discussion. As usual, Community Board 8 is full of different opinions, and they're all valuable. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night.